If you want to shake things up and get out of whatever kind of rut that you might be in, I want to personally invite you to join us at Camp Stop Kidding Yourself. It's actually in Sedona, Arizona, October 10th to the 15th. This is our last retreat of 2022, and you'll be joining 80 other people that are looking to dive deep into the Plant Strong lifestyle and have more fun than you've had since you were in camp as a kid. We're talking bountiful amounts of Plant Strong buffets, world-class lectures, bonfires, stargazing, movie nights, talent show nights, hiking, yoga, pickleball. This is one week you will never, ever forget. Just go to plantstrong.com, click on Sedona. We got about three slots available. I hope to see you there. My goal is to go through the process of living with diabetes so that I can learn everything I possibly can about it and help as many people as possible. That is, I do believe that that is what I was put on this planet for. And I, and I strongly believe that. Now, if I did not have diabetes, I would be eating the same diet, most likely, that I ate when I was 20 years old prior to being diagnosed. And trust me, that diet was not awesome. It was not healthy. So th that diet likely would have led to other chronic diseases. I may have developed hypertension. I may have high cholesterol. I may become overweight. I may develop the same standard American condition that so many other Americans are living with, right? Um, so being diagnosed with diabetes was actually a gateway for me to be able to enter into the world of health and study it and break it all the way down to its building blocks and then build it all the way back up and try and figure out what the heck true health actually is. Wow. And in that process, I'm healthier. I'm, I'm easily 10 times healthier than I was back in the day. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plant Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Imagine, if you will, being in the absolute prime of your life, 21 years old, going to school at Stanford University to study mechanical engineering, playing sports for hours on end, and then it all comes to a screeching halt when you're diagnosed with not one, not two, but three autoimmune diseases, all within a matter of months. My guest today, Cyrus Kambata, went from soccer stud to chronic disease patient when he was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, alopecia, and type 1 diabetes in 2002. For a period of time, he followed his doctor's orders with regard to diet, but he was determined to understand everything that he could about these diagnoses, especially the diabetes. He took agency of his own health and went back to school to learn the science behind the disease, earning a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. Today, class is in session because Cyrus and I dig deep into the science. What exactly is insulin resistance? What is the difference between the different types of diabetes? Can you have too little fat in your diet? What happens when you take the low-carb approach? And what treatments are best for long-term health? My friend, Dr. Michael Clapper, has called the low-carb paleo diets a physiological parlor trick. And today, you learn why from the co-author and co-founder of Mastering Diabetes, Cyrus. An educated person is an empowered person, and that's our goal for today. To arm you with as much knowledge, research, and hope so that you can master your diabetes with a whole foods, plant-based diet that, yes, includes plenty of carbohydrates and a decadent diversity of luscious fruit. 
He may have a PhD, but today he's here to help you master diabetes. Cyrus, what's up? What's up, my man? How you doing? How you doing? I'm good. I've been missing you. Man, I miss you. I, I miss you every day. It's funny because uh, we've been spending some time together here in Austin. And every time I come visit you, I'm like, man, I should live there. I should hang out with Rip every single day. I know. You had the chance. I know. I blew <laughs> it, didn't I? Yep. L located down to the, uh, what is it? Is it the Sunshine State? Sunshine State? <laughs> yeah, Sunshine State in Florida. Yeah, my wife and I just moved to St. Petersburg, which is, man, this place is incredible. Yeah. It's hot every day and there's a beach nearby, so I'm a pretty happy camper. Woo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for coming on the Plant Strong podcast. It's I've been meaning to have you on for you know about three and a half years now and it finally came to uh, fruition. So this is a good <laughs> uh, this is a good day for me. I'm glad I made you wait so long. It's like uh, I was playing hard to get here, huh? <laughs> you have been. <laughs> so uh I really with you out today I want to talk about diabetes because Mm -hmm. You know, what you and Robbie have done with Mastering Diabetes is, to me, nothing short of absolutely phenomenal, um, giving people the tools and the resources and the knowledge to really master a disease that the CDC has labeled as a full-blown pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it's taking down people and shortening their lives um, and, and, in many cases, crippling them unnecessarily. And so I want to dig in with you uh, on, on, on Mastering Diabetes, which, of course, is the title of the book that you and Robbie came out with. What was this like 2019, 2018? It was actually uh, two weeks before the pandemic. Wow. Uh, so we're looking at February 18th, 2020. Uh, right before the world changed uh, <laughs> very how, quickly. How was that book tour for you? Uh, it was actually really fun. I mean, we... We didn't do a physical book tour, but we yeah. were doing a virtual book tour by getting on a ton of podcasts and, uh, you know, coordinating with a lot of affiliate companies that they could try and get the word out to their audience. And I mean, I, I loved it, honestly, because the content that's in that book is something that has literally been in my head yeah. for the better part of a decade. And so writing the book was just an exercise in getting it out of my head and putting it on a piece of paper and writing it in a way where it could actually change people's lives. Yeah. And so it was a really fun experience to not only write the book, but then also be able to talk about the book. And then the best part was that when people were getting the book and we got feedback from it, I mean, people were saying that their, their lives were changed forever. And, you know, like, I'm not sure it gets better than that, honestly. That's like, that's why I get up in the morning and that's why I do what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can relate. So 10 years, this, all this information that's in the book has been swirling around in your head. And now you've got it down in this in this book. Mm -hmm. What makes you uh, such a relevant person to tell people how to master master diabetes? So like, why you as opposed to somebody else? It's a great question. Um, so the reason is because if we if we go backwards in time, um, back to the year 2002, yeah. that's when my life changed fundamentally within a very short period of time. And then positioned me on the track towards health and diabetes. So what happened was that I was going to undergraduate. I was a senior at Stanford University, 2002, studying mechanical engineering. And um, I just wanted to graduate with you know, a degree and then move on with my life. But uh, I was diagnosed in November of that year with type 1 diabetes. And I didn't know anything about health at that point in my life. I was, um, all I knew was that I just felt very strange. I was extremely thirsty. And I mean, Rip, I can't even tell you the type of thirst that I experienced. It was so, it, it was, it was unbelievable because I would be sitting at my desk and I would be trying to study for finals. And I was like, man, I'm pretty thirsty. So I would drink, you know, a 16 ounce glass of water in like five seconds and I'd put it down. And then 10 seconds later, I was like, I think I got thirstier. And then I would repeat that and I put it down. And then five minutes later, I was like, man, did I just get thirstier again? And then I would just repeat this over and over and over again. So on a given day, I was drinking, you know, between one and one and a half gallons of water. And, uh, you know, because of that, I was urinating frequently. So I would go to the bathroom every half an hour, like clockwork. And as a result of that, I was flushing a lot of electrolytes. So just a lot of water in, a lot of water out. And um, then when I tried to go to sleep, 
um, I was so electrolyte depleted that my muscles began to cramp. So you know that feeling when you're lying in bed and all of a sudden your hamstring cramps and it's like extremely painful? Not fun. And, <laughs> and you do everything you can to try and get rid of that tension that built up inside of your hamstring? Well, that would happen in my left hamstring. So then I would like manipulate my body to try and relieve that tension. And then in the process, my right butt cheek would get uh, would, would, would cramp. And then as a result of that, my right calf would cramp and then my abs would cramp. And then before I know my shoulder would cramp. And there were literally moments where I was lying in bed and I was in full body rigor mortis. And I was like, this is unbelievable. What, um, what is happening to me? So I ended up going to the hospital and, um, diagnosed, or sorry, I, I went to the health clinic and at the health clinic, they basically is this at Stanford or is this at uh, UC Berkeley? This is at Stanford. This is at okay. Stanford. Okay. So I, I actually picked up the phone and I called my sister and she's a doctor of osteopathy and family practice. And I explained my symptomology to her and she was like, Cyrus, drop everything that you're doing right now. Go straight to the health center because you're explaining that you have type one diabetes. And I was like, Shanaz, what are you talking about? Type one diabetes. I don't even know what that means. But the only association that I had in my head was that diabetes was about old people and cake. That's it. And I was like, okay, so what am I supposed to do? So she goes, go straight to the health center. Call me when you get there. So I go to the health center. I check myself in. A nurse treats me. She takes a finger stick of blood glucose and walks into another room to go put it into a blood glucose meter and comes back about, I don't know, two minutes later. And I had already fallen asleep. So I was passed out on the table inside of her office. And she walks into the, to the office again. And she goes, how did you get here? And I was like, uh, I walked. And she's like, we need to take you to the hospital right now. And I was like, is this an emergency situation? She's like, absolutely. We got to go. So she, I ended up getting transported to the hospital. And when I was there, they monitored my blood glucose over the course of the next 24 hours. They gave me IV uh, insulin into one arm, and then they gave me fluids into the other arm to try and get me more hydrated, first of all, because I was actually dehydrated. And secondarily, to bring my blood glucose down. And over the course of 24 hours, they said to me, said, said, Cyrus, not only do you have type 1 diabetes and your pancreas no longer secretes a sufficient amount of insulin, but you also have two other autoimmune conditions. The other ones are called Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which had been developing over the course of the previous six months, but it wasn't officially diagnosed until that moment. And then the third one was this thing called alopecia universalis, which is, you can see, I, I have no eyebrows. I have no hair. I have complete total hair loss and I used to have hair. So there's three autoimmune conditions that set in within a six month period. And here I am a 22 year old guy trying to, you know, play soccer, hit on women, go to parties. And all of a sudden that was my life. So I turned into a chronic disease patient instantly and it was a tough pill to swallow. So to answer your question, how did that turn into what I am today? That set me on a course to try and figure out but what let me, before you, before you continue, let yeah. me ask you this. Um, so you got diagnosed with the three autoimmune diseases and one fell swoop. Correct. So the alopecia, was that something, was your hair starting to fall out or how did you get diagnosed with that? Yeah, that's a great question. My, my hair was actually starting to fall out at that point. Um, so what was happening is that uh, my head of hair, I would end up with like small bald spots that would appear sort of like on, um, you know, the left front side. And then it would go to like the, the back middle. And there were these sort of bald spots that were appearing not only on my head, but then I would also get a couple of bald spots on my chest. And um, I also had some bald spots on my legs. And uh, I couldn't really exactly figure out what that was or why it was happening. And funny enough, a friend of mine who was a very good friend of mine from high school had come over to dinner one night and he took a look at me. And he goes, Cyrus. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but you look weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Ari, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. He's like, here's what we're going to do. You're going to finish your food. We're going to go to CVS. I'm going to get a Bic razor and some shaving cream, and I'm going to shave all of your head so that you don't look as weird anymore. How do you feel about that? And I was like, let's do it. So he, we came back to the, uh, we went and got the razor. We came back. He shaved my head. Half an hour later, I had zero hair on my head. And then funny enough, Within the next 24 hours, all the remaining hair that was on my chest and on my legs and on my arms, gone, fell away. Followed the way of the head. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, I still don't fully understand exactly how that happened. But uh, within, if I call it 24, 48 hours, I went from being, you know, having hair to being completely hairless. So and, has anything changed as far as alopecia, as far as you're concerned, since uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and that whole ordeal with the, you know, 
her le- letting well but letting the world know that she's got it and it's a thing you know it was funny i was actually expecting there to be a lot of conversation about alopecia and what causes it and who has it and how's it different from men versus women and receiving a lot of messages from it it was crickets yeah, I mean, there maybe in the world of alopecia, there's a huge conversation happening right now, but I'm not really involved in that world. Right. Um, so from my perspective, nothing really has changed significantly, yeah. other than watching a very entertaining 30 seconds on television. <laughs> you, so when you're in, in airports or parties, does anybody, do little kids ever say, oh, you know, why are you so bald? Or is it, there's so many bald people now, and they probably can't really notice, you know, your eyebrows and your eyelashes and all that stuff. What, and, what the fact really, that, and the fact that you're 40 or over and at this point you have no hair sticking out of your ears <laughs> which is a superpower actually <laughs> well what young kids do who um who kind of like when i'm playing with them a lot of times they'll look at me and they'll be like you don't have any eyebrows and i'm like you're right i don't have any eyebrows what happened what happened to your eyebrows? did you did you lose them did you burn them <laughs> and then i have to go and explain to them but for the most part i, I don't know people have told me that they don't really know that I don't have eyebrows until like, you know, weeks or months go by. And all of a sudden they're like, huh, you don't have eyebrows. That's kind of crazy. But then if you go onto our YouTube channel for Mastering Diabetes and you read the comments, a lot of the comments are about my eyebrows or my lack of eyebrows. And people tell me I look like a weirdo and that they're (laughs) not going to listen to somebody who doesn't have any eyebrows and that my eyebrows fell off because I ate too many mangoes. And it's just like, it's just a circus. Right. But um, it kind of depends on like which, you know, which audience you ask. All right. So let, let's get back. So yeah. um, so why you you get diagnosed and then what's 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 your next move? OK, so get diagnosed. And then um, the doctors at that time told me they said, listen, we can't really give you any recommendations, any health recommendations for reversing alopecia or for uh, reversing Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, because you know what? We don't really know. But when it comes to managing type one diabetes, you can eat a low carbohydrate diet because if you do that, then that'll keep that'll do two things. There's two promises. Number one, it will keep your blood glucose low. And number two, it will keep your insulin use low. So if you eat a low carbohydrate diet, your blood glucose will become very controllable and your insulin use will stay nice and low. Do that. And I said, fine, sounds like a plan. So at the age of 22, they told me to eat more milk, more cheese, more red meat, more white meat, more peanut butter, more bacon, more dairy products, you name it. So I ate all that stuff. And, did, and you, uh, did you like eating all that stuff? I loved eating all that stuff when I was that age. I mean, I looked forward to it, honestly, because I kind of grew up on that food, plus, you know, some vegetables here and there. Um, so it wasn't that big of a deal for me. In fact, I kind of liked the diagnosis, to be perfectly honest. But then things started to change pretty rapidly. So about three months in, four months in, somewhere around there, I recognized that it was really hard for me to exercise. That was the first thing that became a little bit strange. And what would happen and, is that and is exercise and is exercise something that has up to this point in your life been important for you? Oh man. I mean, I started moving my body when I was four years old, three years old. And my mom was, you know, she would enroll me in every sport. So like I literally grew up from the time I was like, before I could even, you know, remember baseball, soccer, swimming, running, hiking, basketball, you name it, everything that that's, that was my currency. That's how I, you know, spent a lot of my time was just moving my body. Probably very similar to you, you know, growing up as a, as a young, active athlete. Yeah. So all throughout high school, I played soccer and then I began lifting weights. And like that just became a staple of who I was and what I did. So I get to college and I'm trying to continue to do the same thing. And all of a sudden I recognize that like something is wrong. Like my body just does not feel the way that it had felt previously. I felt slower. I felt uh, I wasn't overweight. I felt slower. I just felt more lethargic. And, um, I recognized that my recovery from exercise was, was horrendous. So as an example, I would go play one soccer game for the last about 90 minutes long. And under normal circumstances, I would be able to recover from that soccer game within 24 hours. I'd be sore. My legs would be tight. I'd stretch. I'd drink some water. Everything would be fine. Then I could go out and I play again 24 hours later. But in this scenario, when I was first diagnosed with type one diabetes, it would take me four days to recover from one game of soccer. Okay. And If you're an avid athlete, four days is unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. You just can't get the volume of exercise you want in. You're not going to make strength gains. You're not going to make endurance gains. It's just not going to happen. So I would sit on the couch regularly, you know, the second day after exercise. And I was like, oh my God, why do my hamstrings hurt so much? Why, why is my chest tight? 
I didn't even use my chest while I was playing soccer. What the heck is going on? So that was happening. In addition to that, my blood glucose became a roller coaster. Again, the promise was that my glucose would become controllable. But in reality, if you looked at my blood glucose meter, it was a random number generator. I mean, my glucose was just this like sawtooth pattern of up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down all day long, every day for like months on end. And as a result of that, when your blood glucose goes high, not only does it make you feel pretty low energy and just kind of like get on your nerves, but you have to inject a lot of insulin to lower your blood glucose. So, you know, inadvertently my insulin use began to creep up over the course of time. So by the time I hit my one year marker, eating a low carbohydrate diet, living with type one diabetes, my insulin use had doubled. I started out at like 25 units of insulin per day. There were certain days where I was injecting 50 to 55 units of insulin per day. But despite the fact that I was eating a low carbohydrate diet, so nothing that the low carbohydrate, you know, promises or the low carbohydrate world had told me was actually coming true. Mm. So at that point I was like, you know what, I got to find something different. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to find something. But did you, did you go back to the doctors that had prescribed this and say, Hey, this isn't working. I mean, am I an anomaly here or, or you know, the prescription that you've given me is, is messed up here. Very good question. So the truth is that when, when I was, I was working with an endocrinologist at that time and his, whenever I would try and talk about diet, it was like the conversation just didn't go anywhere because as you know, doctors don't really understand nutrition. So if you start to ask a doctor about, well, what's the difference between a turkey burger and a red meat and you know, should I eat potato buns or should I eat potatoes or should I eat hot dog buns, whatnot? Yeah. They don't know the answers to those questions. So the thing that my doctors were concerned with is downloading the data from my blood glucose meter and then giving me a prescription for a different type of insulin. That was their entire focus. So the conversation about nutrition was just kind of like, if I would bring something up, it was just gone. It wouldn't even, I wouldn't even get a response. So their focus was very myopic, extremely they, myopic. They weren't looking holistically at, at the, uh, at no. the full, full equation here. And the most important part of the equation, which is what are you putting in your mouth? Exactly. And I mean, I would venture to say that in today's world, things haven't changed that much to be perfectly honest, because 20 lot, years later, 20 years later, 20 years later, I mean, I talked to people with diabetes left and right. And I hear the same story from people over and over and over again about my internal medicine doctor said this, and my PCP said this, and my endocrinologist said this, and that the answer is always a low carbohydrate diet. Eat low carb. Carbs are bad for you. Don't eat carbs. You're allergic to carbs, blah, 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 blah. You know, and it's just, I got the same advice, but yet uh, not only did it not work for me, I'm also seeing in thousands and thousands of patients and, and clients over the course of time that it's happening to them too. So how, controllable insulin yeah. use going up, oral yeah. medications going up, becoming more overweight, more hypertensive, higher cholesterol, you know, uh, more brain fog, worse skin and the list goes on. So how did you, who introduced you to a kind of a, a, a smarter path? Okay. So I was living in San Francisco at the time and, um, I had some friends who, uh, just happened to be more, you know, they happened to be eating, I believe it was a hundred percent plant-based diet mm -hmm. and it was just out of pure coincidence. So I was talking to them. I was like, why would you do that? And what are you gaining from it? And would it work for somebody with diabetes? Yes or no. And so one of my friends said, Hey Cyrus, you should talk to this guy named Doug Graham. Doug Graham is, uh, he's 80, a, 10, he's, 10, right? Exactly. He's a very smart guy. You should pick up the phone and call him or send him an email. So I did. And um, when I talked to Doug, I basically said, hey, Doug, listen, I have type 1 diabetes. This is my experience eating a low-carbohydrate diet. It's not working for me. I'm an athlete. Um, can you make me feel like a normal human being? And he was on the other side of the phone, and he laughed, and he was like, Cyrus, you have no idea what's about to happen to you. Uh, I'm ho hosting a, a, a sports retreat uh, in Colorado in like three weeks. Why don't you show up and come hang out with me for a week, and I'll show you everything, and it'll, I'll flip your world upside down. And I said, great, let's do it. So, uh, I went to go hang out with him for a week at his retreat. And while we were there, he showed me how to do literally the exact opposite of what I was doing. Okay. So I was eating a relatively animal heavy, animal product heavy diet, and it was higher in fat and protein and low in carbohydrate. He told me how to switch over to a 100% plant-based diet. That was a raw food diet that was 80% or more from carbohydrate energy and then approximately 10% from, from fat and 10% from protein. 
and lower my, uh, I'm sorry, uh, eat nothing but whole foods and basically get rid of all animal products, period, end of story. And so I was like, great. I mean, I don't know what this is going to do to me, but I'm just going to have this willing suspension of disbelief that this might work. Let's see what happens. And Doug said, great, just watch and learn. So what I recognized was that within the first 24 hours of being under his supervision and his guidance, uh, my blood glucose values began to fall fast. Okay. So I was, like I was saying, I, you know, I normally would have this sawtooth curve where I would hit 200s and 300s on a daily basis, which is, you know, normal blood glucose is supposed to be approximately a hundred, call it somewhere between 70 and 130 and, you know, try and keep it there within that range all day long, every day. Um, my glucose going into this was in the high 100s, 200s, sometimes 300s. And within 24 hours of being under his guidance, my blood glucose fell down into the low 100s. And sometimes it fell even below the threshold for hypoglycemia down beneath 70. And so I would have to like, you know, suspend my basal insulin on my insulin pump and then just try and eat more food, eat more food, eat more food. So if we fast forward over the course of seven days, I walked away from that retreat having uh, gone from eating 125 grams of carbohydrate on average per day before the retreat to 650 grams of carbohydrate per day at the end of the seven days. Five-fold so, increase. Five-fold increase right there. Five-fold increase within seven days. And you would think uh, if, the, if the low carbohydrate methodology was true, if it worked, if it had a solid biological and physiological reasoning behind it, then if I five-folded my carbohydrate intake, I should have at least five-folded my insulin use. Yeah. Because that's what the carbohydrate, the low-carbohydrate world tells you, that more carbs equals more insulin equals more weight gain equals more cholesterol equals more inflammation in many tissues. So I was expecting to use more insulin, but I had a five-fold increase in my carbohydrate intake, and my insulin use whew, fell by 40%. So Incredible. I was eating five times as much carbohydrate energy for 40% less insulin. And, and, and when that happened, I was like, Doug, what the hell is happening to me? And Doug said, Cyrus, I, I, he, he explained a lot of the biology to me. And then yeah. from that moment onwards, I, I said, you know what? I'm going to go study this stuff because I really want to understand the biological, the actual biochemistry underlying what is happening inside of me. So I put myself back to graduate school. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no. So I was going to say, so you wanted it. And so what did, where did that lead you? Yeah. Like what's, what school and what? Yeah. Degree? Okay. Yeah. So then at that point I said, this is really fascinating for, for two years. I just lived this lifestyle and you know, I became, you know, I returned back to athletics and I became extremely active and I got on my bicycle and I rode my bike 16,000 miles in the first year and beyond. Then I decided that I wanted to put uh, a PhD level education behind this. So I went to UC Berkeley and I studied there for five years and I got a PhD in nutritional biochemistry so that I could answer one question and one question only. And that one question was, am I a freak of nature? Yeah. That's literally all I wanted to know was what's happening inside of me. Am I, am I some weird genetic anomaly or is what's happening inside of me also applicable to other people with either type one or type two or prediabetes? That's what I wanted to know. And while I was at grad school, my mind was blown even more than Doug had blown my mind. And I began to realize that there is literally 100 years of scientific evidence dating back to 1920 that clearly documents the relationship between carbohydrate, fat, protein, and insulin requirements. And the long and short of it is that the, the low carbohydrate world wants you to believe that carbohydrates are bad for you and carbohydrates are, lead to increased chronic disease but the scientific research shows the exact opposite that when you eat whole food carbohydrates coming from fruits and starchy vegetables and legumes and whole grains and you increase the proportion of those foods inside of your diet your chronic disease risk comes down the amount of insulin resistance inside of your body which we can geek out on a little bit yeah. here goes down your blood glucose control becomes better and all of a sudden life becomes way easier how is it that in 2022, if we've had now over a hundred years of scientific research that has shown that a high carbohydrate, low fat, whole food, plant-based diet is the answer, how could we have it so wrong? 
How could the medical establishment be so upside down? And how many people are walking around with diabetes right now, either, you know, type one or type two or 1.5 mm-hmm. or gestational that um, are, are doing the wrong, the incorrect protocol mm-hmm. and are in this state of wondering, just like you were, what is wrong with me? It sounds like a miserable existence. Yeah, it is really not a fun place to be. It really is not. So to answer your question, how is it that we're 100 years from yeah. the beginning of the research and we're still getting it wrong? Um, I'll say two things. Number one, the medical institution and the pharmaceutical industry are extremely powerful machines. Okay. And they are intertwined with one another. When doctors go to medical school, they don't learn anything about food. They learn everything there is to know about how to diagnose and how to treat disease, mainly through the use of pharmaceutical medication. Uh, so the conversation about diet and plant-based diet doesn't really factor into their education at all. And then as a result of that, when people go to the doctor, they don't really learn about food. Food isn't taught in school. And so most people are walking around completely ignorant about what food can actually do for them and how it can influence their risk for chronic disease, many chronic diseases. Number two, if you were to ask your dad the same question, right? Hey, Dr. Esselstyn, why is it that the eating a low fat plant-based whole food diet can truly reverse atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease in general, but yet the cardiology world doesn't want to believe it, doesn't understand it, still prescribes, you know, statin medications, blood pressure medications, and unnecessary interventions at times. What would he say to that? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think it'd be the exact same answer. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it is, it's a sad state of affairs that we're letting, um, these huge, powerful industries and also in many ways, egos, um, and business, um, what's, what's the quote that, um, it's something like, like how many, if you're, if, if a, if a cardiologist is faced with telling somebody, uh, you know what, you can totally take care of this heart disease, but it's going to require sweet potatoes, steel cut oats, green leafies and all this other stuff. Or he can say, you know what? Nobody ever eats that way. Instead, what I would recommend is let's give you a stent. If you get any more blockages, you can just come back. We can play, you know, surgical whack-a-mole, put in, you know, another three, four, five, however many we need. So to me, you know, he's letting his, his, uh, 50,000 or 75,000 procedure cloud his judgment. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. And another thing that I think is also factoring into this equation is that in the world in which we live today, social media has become a sort of Mm. very, you know, whatever it's, it's all over the place. So, you know, whether you like it or not, your life is influenced by social media. And what I have learned by paying attention to what people post on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and beyond is that a lot of what's circulated on, on, on social media platforms is not about the science. There are very few people who can actually comprehend the science because it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of focus to be able to read a scientific paper in detail and truly understand who were the subjects, what period of time, why was it done this way? What do the results mean? What is the conclusion? What is the, you know, what can be done in the future and what is the takeaway message? But on social media, what people do is they talk about their feelings. They talk about what they think is the right answer and how this felt to me when I did it. Right. And so what people are communicating is purely emotional or mainly emotional and emotion has a place in this world of, of lifestyle medicine, but it is not the truth because the truth comes from the scientific world, but only a fraction of people have the opportunity to be able to actually understand that and relay it to the actual general public. Cyrus, let's dive into the, the science. I think this is a perfect segue for us. Um, like for example, one of the things that I don't think if we were to ask a hundred people on the street, what is insulin resistance? Or even probably 
a lot of people that have type 2 diabetes, they probably couldn't give us a really good answer. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's fundamentally important that we discuss insulin resistance and what exactly it is. And as you state on the cover of your book, right, the revolutionary method to reverse insulin resistant per- insulin resistance permanently mm-hmm. in type 1, 1.5, 2, prediabetes, and gestational diabetes. Correct. Because if I was looking at that, I'd say, well, Cyrus, I mean, I know for a fact that you cannot reverse type 1 diabetes. Correct. Because your pancreas is no longer, you know, generating the, those insulin cells. Correct. Um, so, so talk to me. What okay. am I missing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here we go. So the name of the game is insulin resistance, just like you mentioned. And the reason why we focus 100% of our, of our uh, energy and on our education on understanding and talking about insulin resistance is because it is the uniting factor or the puzzle piece that connects the entire diabetes world. So the diabetes world has multiple different types of diabetes. You got type 1, type 1.5. They're both autoimmune conditions, which are non-reversible. Type 1 affects mainly people who are less than 30 years old. Type 1.5 affects people who are older than 30 years old. It it has a slower onset and is not 100%. uh, doesn't lead to full insulin dependence. So those two are autoimmune conditions. Then you have prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. All three of those are lifestyle-induced versions of diabetes. Mm -hmm. They have a small genetic precursor but are mainly influenced by the activity that you do or do not perform the amount of alcohol that you do or do not drink, the type of food that you are eating and beyond. So we have five different, you know, classes or five different flavors of diabetes, if you will. And the simplest way to connect all of them together is to talk about the underlying condition that influences your blood glucose control across all five of those. And that is called insulin resistance. Mm. Okay. So what insulin resistance is at its root is it is a condition which can be created inside of your muscle and inside of your liver primarily by the consumption of a diet that is uh, high in saturated fat. Now, when you say your muscle, do you mean mean like all the cells in our muscles? What do you mean by muscle? Yes. So you have what's called skeletal muscle, skeletal muscles all throughout all all over your body, right? It's, you have uh, hundreds of muscles that span everywhere from your shoulders to your chest, to your triceps, to your biceps, to your forearms, to your, your abdomen, to your lower back, to your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your calf muscles, you name it all throughout your body. Yeah. Okay, you got large muscles, you got small muscles, you got everything in between. Um, each one of those muscles is composed of billions of cells. Okay. And billions with a B sometimes potentially even trillions, depending on how large the muscle is. Wow. And those cells are critically important for a number of overall physiological function. And um, the function, the ability of those muscle cells to be able to operate in an, in an optimal manner is critical to life, absolutely critical to life. And I'm not talking about people who are uh, you know, going to be an Olympic athlete or somebody who is even you know, uh, an athlete. A, 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 sig- a very active individual. I'm talking about just your average individual who may or may not be working out, who may or may not be performing any activity. The function of those muscle cells is critically important for your chronic disease risk. Hmm. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, your liver. Your liver is the hardest working organ in your entire body. I would say arguably that your liver works harder than your brain. Okay. And that's a, that's a very uh, controversial statement, but the point is that your liver can, can perform more functions. It has a more diverse range of metabolic functions than any other tissue in your body. Mm. Okay. Your liver can manufacture and store many different carbohydrate, fat, and protein molecules. It is involved in cholesterol metabolism. It's involved in the production of urea. It detoxifies pharmaceutical drugs that you consume. It produces hormones that are going into your blood. It communicates with your adrenal gland. It uh, influences your sex drive and beyond. Okay. So there are many aspects of liver function that are absolutely critical to normal physiological function. And insulin resistance happens to impact both of those tissues, your muscle and your liver. And it gets both of them into a state of dysfunction that can then increase your risk for prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. 
Wow. Okay? And also make your blood glucose control very hard and very challenging in type 1 and 1.5. Okay? Yeah. So the question really becomes, well, what the heck is insulin resistance and what causes it? Okay? If you go on the internet and you type in insulin resistance and you try and figure out what it is, um, most of the information that you'll find on social media, again, is not about truth. It's not about science. It's not about education. It's about feeling. It's about opinions. The stuff that you'll find on social media will tell you that carbohydrate causes insulin resistance, mm -hmm. that sugar causes insulin resistance. And the truth is that some of that is true, can be true, but in very, very specific physiological situations. Okay. The truth is that insulin resistance is most easily induced and most repeatably induced in animals. And I say animals because that includes humans plus also other mammalian uh, or, or other mammals is easily induced in all mammals using a diet that is high in fat. Okay. So let's transport backwards in time. Let's go back to 2007 when I first began my graduate degree. Okay. My professor at the time said, Cyrus, I'm going to give you a project for the next five years. And the project is to, to understand every single aspect of insulin resistance. I want you to learn what causes it, how to induce it in laboratory mice and in laboratory rats, and then how you can rescue insulin sensitivity using either intermittent fasting, calorie restriction, or movement. Mm. Okay. So this is a really fascinating topic and there's, you know, a thousand different rabbit holes that you can get caught in. So my first homework assignment was to try and figure out, well, how do I create insulin resistance in laboratory mice and laboratory rats? What am I going to do? And my, my, what my head was saying is just feed them a diet. That's got a lot of sugar in it. Cyrus feed them right. fruit. What's that? I said, right. Yeah. 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 Feed yeah. them either artificial sweeteners or fructose or uh, high fructose corn syrup. Okay. And when I looked into the research to try and figure out how insulin resistance was induced in laboratory animals, the answer was totally different. The answer was very different. The answer was feed them a diet that is high in saturated fat for a minimum of eight weeks. If you do that, animals will become insulin resistant and it's very, very repeatable, extremely easy to measure, extremely easy to uh, perform. So is, so, so is this leading you to believe now that, wow, it's not about the sugar, it's about the fat? It's not about the sugar, it's the fat. But here's the thing. This is 2007. Re yeah. Go backwards four more years into when I transitioned to a plant-based diet, 2003. I had already had that experience myself because I transitioned to eating a diet that was much higher in carbohydrate energy. And as a result of that, I, I ate more carbohydrate and I had less fat. And all of a sudden, my life improved dramatically. My insulin use came down. My blood glucose came down. So I knew that intuitively. And then the research confirmed that. And then it confirmed it over and over and over and over and over again. And I saw this repeated in not only mice and rats, but I also saw it in human studies. I also saw it in rat studies. I'm sorry, in rabbit studies. Mm -hmm. I also saw it in studies involving dogs. It was the same thing because this is a mammalian uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a, it's a mammalian physiological right. mechanism right. that you can induce insulin resistance by eating a diet that contains excess saturated fat. So here's how this works. Fat in food is locked up in a molecule known as triglyceride. Okay, yeah. So triglyceride is just the storage form of fatty acids inside of mammals and inside of fruits and vegetables and plant material. Okay, So triglyceride is what we... what what, how fat exists primarily in the natural world. If you consume triglyceride inside of a food that contains a significant amount of fat, like let's say you're consuming red meat or you contain, you can, you consume uh, cheese or maybe even an avocado, or maybe you have some olive oil. Okay. All of those foods tend to be fat rich and they contain triglyceride. So you, you consume the triglyceride. It travels into your mouth. It goes down your esophagus. It gets inside of your stomach. Inside of your stomach is a, is a sort of uh, an acid chamber where the walls of your uh, stomach are secreting hydrochloric acid into the lumen. And they're basically using that as a, as a mechanism to try and get access to the food and start to unfold it. So primarily protein is denatured and unfolded from its three-dimensional structure and linearized inside of your stomach. At that point, the, the partially digested food material called chyme ends up trans, uh, transitioning into your small intestine. Now, your small intestine is a magical, magical organ because inside of your small intestine, that's where the bulk of nutrient digestion and absorption happens. So in your small intestine, 
there are digestive enzymes that are that are uh, that, that are secreted by your liver and your pancreas and your gallbladder and your small intestine itself. Hmm. And those that cocktail of enzymes has a very specific function. And that is these enzymes go and they effectively attack the food that you are eating or that you just ate. And their purpose is to try and take this food and take it from its large, uh, build, its large, um, you know, large macro molecules and cut them into individual pieces and then take those individual pieces and absorb them through the walls of your small intestine and put them into your blood. So when it comes to triglyceride, the triglyceride is basically cut. You have the reason it's called triglyceride is because there are three fatty acid molecules attached to a glycerol. So you have a glycerol backbone plus three fatty acids. And the digestive enzymes hydrolyze or cut the glycerol from the three fatty acids. And then those three fatty acids are then transported into your lymph system. And then in your lymph system, they are then eventually dumped into your blood. And then once they're inside of your blood, they are then packaged into these things called chylomicron particles. Okay. So there's some funky words that we use in the biology world. But the idea here is these chylomicron particles are these little spaceships. And they're spaceships that contain a bunch of cargo. And there are billions of them in circulation inside of your blood at any moment in time. So right after a fat-rich meal, these chylomicrons are loaded with the cargo of fatty acids. And these fatty acids circulate in chylomicrons. And their, their goal is to get to a tissue so that the fatty acids can be unloaded into a tissue. Okay? Now, if I could design the human body or if I could design mammals from the ground up, what I would do is I would make it so that those chylomicron particles only really have access to one tissue. And that one tissue is called fat tissue or adipose tissue. Because if those chylomicron particles went only to the fat tissue and delivered their cargo into the fat tissue, yeah. that would actually be physiologically safe. Because your fat tissue is actually a very safe place to keep fatty acids. It's designed both mechanically and enzymatically to be able to take up large amounts of fat when present and then store that fat and lock it up in a triglyceride one more time and keep it until it doesn't need it anymore, then it can cut it and deliver it to other tissues. But here's the problem. When those chylomicrons load, are loaded with their fatty acid cargo and they circulate, they not only deliver fat to the fat tissue, which is again, the safe place to put it, but they also deliver the excess to your liver and they also deliver the excess to your muscle. Mm. Okay? So now you have fatty acids that are basically getting partitioned into one of three tissues, your adipose tissue, number one, and then your muscle and your liver is number two and number three. So does it, does it get partitioned into the liver and the muscles after the adipose tissue has kind of been like maxed out or not necessarily? Yeah. It, so it actually, the truth be told is that it depends on a number of, uh, okay. you know, circulating biomarkers and um, yeah. hormones. Okay. But it right. just, seem, it, it seems to me like this miracle right of yes. our of our bodies yes it doesn't seem like it would be flawed it like everything seems to be like it is for a reason a good reason so Correct. maybe so maybe the flaw isn't in you know um these spaceships and where they're delivering stuff maybe the flaw is in the excessive amount of food we're eating that's exactly right so it's not a flaw in the organism's creation or in the, in the way that it's designed. Yeah. It's a flaw in the fact that we are consuming excess saturated fat, which puts pressure on this process and then causes this process to go awry. So you're absolutely right from that perspective. So yeah. to answer your previous question, yeah, the, the, the priority is yes, put as much fatty acids into adipose tissue as possible as, as top priority. And then number two, the excess or the overflow ends up getting partitioned into your liver, into your muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So if you're eating a diet that contains a significant amount of saturated fat, then the amount of, of fatty acid that goes inside of your liver and muscle will go up over the course of time. Right now, here's the problem. When saturated fat gets inside of your liver and gets inside of your muscle, that is okay in small quantities, your liver and your muscle inside of each cell inside of the, what are called the hepatocytes, which are the liver cells. And then the uh, myocytes, which are the muscle cells, they have the enzymatic machinery to be able to uptake saturated fat in small quantities and store it in this thing called a lipid droplet. And so the lipid droplet is literally like this little globule of fat that's intracellular 
that is used as an energy source for that cell. It's literally like a backup fuel mechanism, and that cell can use that as energy and burn it for ATP and then perform useful cellular work. But the problem is that when you're consuming a diet that has a lot of saturated fat, then you force those myocytes and you force those hepatocytes to, to accumulate excess saturated fat beyond their design. And as a result of that, that lipid droplet starts to grow a little bit larger than it was designed for mm -hmm. and gets to grow over the course of time. Now, the problem is that when that lipid droplet grows, one of the, the primary dysfunctions that, that happens inside of the cell is that the cell begins to block the action of insulin. Okay, now why the heck would the cell do that? So there's okay. resistance. So there's resistance. There's resistance because from the cell's perspective, the cell is sitting there and it's being given excess saturated fatty acids that it didn't necessarily ask for, nor was it designed to store. Mm -hmm. But it can't really block that from coming in because there's excess fatty acids floating in the blood in the chylomicron particles that were there because the, the person, the host ate a significantly, a, a large amount of saturated fat. So these fatty acid molecules get inside of the liver and inside of the muscle beyond the design. And then these, these liver and muscle cells are like, what am I supposed to do? How do I block this stuff from coming in? So they, they slow down the ability of insulin to do its job because insulin is the single most powerful anabolic hormone in mammals. And wow. what that means is that anabolic basically means synthesis or to, to manufacture, to create. So insulin is the single most powerful hormone that promotes number one, fuel storage and number two, uh, cell, uh, cell growth. Okay. So if you're trying to store more fuel or you're trying to grow a cell, yeah, the way that you would do it is by allowing that cell to communicate very well with insulin. So what these cells do is they basically go like, Oh crap, there's too much stuff coming inside of me. Tell insulin to go away, Just decrease your ability to communicate with insulin. And by doing that, then when insulin comes and knocks on the door and says, hey, knock, knock, there's some glucose in the blood, there's some fatty acids in the blood, there's some amino acids in the blood, do you want to take it up? Those cells are like, uh-uh, I'm not listening to you anymore, insulin. You already put a bunch of stuff inside of me. I got to get rid of this stuff first. Go away. And so as a result of that, the next time that you eat something that's carbohydrate rich, let it be a banana or a bowl of rice or a bowl of quinoa or, or a potato, okay, the carbohydrate molecules that are inside of that food get broken down into glucose. The glucose wants to get access to your liver and muscle, the exact same cells that already accumulated excess saturated fat. Yeah. So the glucose comes to the door of the cell and the glucose is like, hey, insulin, tell the cell I'm here. So insulin goes knock, knock. Hey, liver cell, knock, knock. Muscle cell, there's glucose in the blood. Would you take it up right now? And both of those respond by saying, sorry. I'm not listening to you right now. I got a bunch of stuff. Let me get rid of this stuff first. Leave that glucose in the blood. So what ends up happening is there's a traffic jam yeah. of glucose inside of your blood and a traffic jam of insulin inside of your blood. So insulin cannot signal to the liver and muscle as effectively, mm -hmm. and glucose cannot enter the liver or muscle as effectively. So you end up with what's called hyperglycemia, which is excess glucose in your blood. And then number two, hyperinsulinemia, which is excess insulin in your blood. So classic insulin resistance is when you go to the doctor and the doctor takes a whole panel of different biomarkers and they find out that your fasting glucose is high. That's hyperglycemia. Yeah, and yeah. if they do measure your insulin level are likely to find that your fasting insulin is also high. And that right there tells you that there's a traffic jam inside of your liver and muscle. Fix that problem and fix it first. Isn't that interesting? Um, and so, and so that is why there's so much confusion around um, people thinking it's a sugar a sugar issue, when when in the fact of the matter is it is an excessive fat issue. And and when you say you keep saying saturated fat, correct? Does it have to be saturated fat, or does like monounsaturated fat, or uh, even po enough polyunsaturated fat? Could they do the same thing? Yeah, good question. So there's basically like, you can think of there as being, there's three different types of fat. There's trans fat, which is like a hydrogenated fat that, that results from a hydrogenation process that humans invented. 
Okay. Small amounts of trans fat are actually present inside of, you know, the natural world, but in, in microscopic quantities, trans fat is, uh, uh, very, very dangerous. That can actually harm endothelial cells and increase the atherosclerotic process and increase your LDL cholesterol. So you don't want that stuff. Number two, there's unsaturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids are the ones that you talked about, the MUFAs and the PUFAs, the mono unsaturated fatty acids and the poly unsaturated fatty acids. Now, those are considered unsaturated because from a chemical perspective, they don't have a full, you know, a full array of hydrogen molecules. Don't worry about the biology, but those molecules are actually bent. They are bent molecules. So from a structural perspective, they're not linear. And that makes a big difference because bent fatty acids, when they get inside of the cellular architecture are not used for energy. Hmm. They are used for other purposes. So the actual three-dimensional structure of that molecule makes it so that instead of burning that for ATP and trying to get energy out of it, those monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fatty acids are used for other purposes. They're used for like membrane fluidity inside of the, uh, the, uh, the um, what do you call it? The fluid <laughs> membrane on the outside of the cell or even membrane fluidity on the actual organelles themselves inside of the cell, Okay. Some of them are slightly more pro-inflammatory. Some of them are slightly more anti-inflammatory. But the idea here is they're, they're, they have a different function altogether. Mm. And so when I'm talking about excess accumulation of fatty acids, I'm talking primarily saturated fat because the saturated fat molecules are linear and they are used for energy. Mm -hmm. Those are the molecules that are stored inside of your adipose tissue and your liver and your muscle and can be broken down and they can yield ATP, which is useful energy for cells to use to operate on. Do you know why it is that um, fat, unlike glucose, doesn't need an insulin escort into the cells and it can just go right in there whenever it seems like it wants to? It just is unfair, Cyrus. It is. It is. You're, you're asking such a good question. It's such a good question. And truth be told, I don't know the answer to that question. I will be the first person to tell you, I don't know the answer. Okay. Sure. But you hit it on the head here, which is that when fatty acids are present in those chylomicron particles and those chylomicron particles knock on the door of the liver and the muscle and they're like, Hey, knock, knock. I got some fatty acids here for you. They, those fatty acids can get inside of the liver and muscle cells effectively without being blocked. They don't need an insulin to come along with it. They don't need some other molecule yeah. to act as an escort or a signal for them to get inside. So when there's more saturated fat inside of your blood, then that means that there's going to be more saturated fat inside of your liver and inside of your muscle. Why? I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that mechanism. Yeah. To, 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 yeah. that. But yeah. the mechanism of transport of those fatty acids inside using these things called fatty acid transport proteins in the membrane makes it so that it's literally just like it's a diffusion process, meaning that when there's more in the blood, then it ends up diffusing into the tissues and getting transported into the tissues so the tissues end up soaking it up. So, yeah, this, I, we, could talk, I, we could talk for three hours about insulin resistance. It's just kind of nutty how it's just we a could. wormhole. But um, I want to talk about a lot of other things while I have you here. Yep. Um, but before we move on from insulin resistance... Let me ask you this. So like the keto and the paleo people that are suggesting that I am hearing an echo there, hmm. um, suggesting a low carbohydrate diet. They're never ever testing in a true form to see if you're insulin resistance, in, right? So could you explain that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really s subtle point, but a very important point. Mm. Um, in the research, um, what you will find is that studies that investigate um, how a low carbohydrate diet uh, improves or so well, what is the effect of a low carbohydrate diet on people living with either prediabetes or type two diabetes, you'll find a similar story for most research, which is that when you feed someone with prediabetes or type two diabetes, AKA somebody with, with insulin resistance, a low carbohydrate diet, number one, their blood glucose will come down. Mm -hmm. Number two, they will lose weight. Number three, their fasting insulin level 
will come down. And number four, their A1C level will come down. Okay. Their A1C being a marker, a measure of like three month average blood glucose concentrations. Right. So I'll repeat that. You eat a low carbohydrate diet, fasting glucose comes down, fasting insulin comes down, A1C comes down, and weight loss happens. Okay. So if you put all those together, and you monitor people over the course of a, I don't know, two month period, three month period, six month period, what you're likely to find is that at the end of that intervention, those people are healthier. They lost weight, their A1C came down, their fasting glucose is down and their fasting insulin is down. And so this is a, this is a, a, a it's a challenging situation because a low carbohydrate diet leads to these short-term results and these short-term results on a piece of paper make you look healthier. Okay. In conjunction with that, often people recognize that their blood pressure comes down and um, they oftentimes report that they have a lot more energy. Okay. And a lot of this can be just explained literally by nothing more than weight loss. Okay. So rather than saying I lost weight in addition to all these things, think about it this way. You eat a low carbohydrate diet. A low carbohydrate diet is a rapid weight loss tool by losing weight. Mm. Then all those other biomarkers start to fall in line. By losing weight, your A1C comes down. By losing weight, your fasting glucose comes down. By losing weight, your fasting insulin comes down. By losing weight, you end up with lower blood pressure. Okay? So if you put weight loss as like the first domino in a chain of other dominoes down the road, you'll find out that weight loss is actually the reason why so many other things improved. Now, here's the kicker. Those people are improving all those other biomarkers, but they're actually becoming more insulin resistant. Okay. At the same time. Yeah. They're becoming simultaneously. So they're getting improved biomarkers, but yet they're becoming more insulin resistant because I told you earlier, insulin resistance is a function of the total amount of fat that you're eating and ketogenic diets are extremely high fat diets between 70 and 80% on average. Mm. Okay. So how is it that somebody's getting more insulin resistant, but yet their biomarkers are improving? And the answer is because a low carbohydrate diet is literally a glucose suppressing tool. That's the way that I like to think about it. When you eat a ketogenic diet, you are playing the carbohydrate avoidance game. Mm -hmm. You are not eating potatoes. You are not eating whole grains. You are not eating starchy vegetables. You are not eating fruits. You're eating red meat, white meat, dairy products, fish, chicken, peanut butter, olive oil, and the like. Okay. So by doing that, by not putting carbohydrate energy into your mouth, you are never challenging. You are never knocking on the door of the pancreas being like, Hey, pancreas, go manufacture insulin and go make that insulin do something inside of the liver and muscle. And as a result of that, you sort of like shut down the glucose economy, if you will. So you've suppressed the glucose economy and you've turned up the fatty acid economy. So now your liver, your muscle, and, um, uh, you, the, 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 your liver, your muscle, plus uh, the, the lipoprotein particles inside of your blood are all operating in the currency of fatty acids. Mm. And when they're operating in the currency of fatty acids and carbohydrate metabolism is kind of told to just go sit by the wayside, then great. Things look good on a piece of paper and your glucose is nice and low. But the minute mm. that you take somebody who's eating a, a ketogenic diet and you, the minute you feed them one banana, one potato, something small, a small amount of carbohydrate, call it 25 grams, maybe 30 grams of carbohydrate. They are in such an insulin resistant state that the glucose molecules from those carbohydrates inside of that food are practically unmetabolizable because insulin can't really get those glucose molecules inside of their liver and muscle. And as a result of that, if you follow them over the course of the next two hours, their glucose sky high, 200, 300 and beyond. So, so, okay. So if it, if it works, Right. It's, I mean, it's all, almost seems like a, as Dr. Clapper says, a physiological parlor trick of sorts. Yeah. Right. To make you look like uh, you're, you know, you've, you've solved your insulin resistance when the reality is a potato or a banana, you know, or something like this causes it, to, causes it to skyrocket. And now you can point to that as the issue. Um, when the, in fact, you're telling me the issue, it's, it's not the, the sugar that's in these whole plant-based foods. It's the fact that we have been just bombarding our, our cells and our liver and our muscles with all this fat. And now we are full blown insulin resistance. I mean, it is severe. So going back to when you were doing something similar 
at 22. Um, but you didn't feel good. And was this not working for you? Because I think you were, you were getting the, uh, what was it? You saw the chainsaw effect or the rip oh, saw yeah, effect? The, the sawtooth effect. The sawtooth effect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. Your, your question is basically, if what you're saying is that when people eat a ketogenic diet, their glucose comes down and they look better on a piece of paper and they're, they're sort of like this suppressed the carbohydrate economy. Yeah. Then how come that didn't happen in you? And the answer is very straightforward. I didn't eat a ketogenic diet. I was eating a general low carbohydrate diet and a general low carbohydrate diet. Like if you look in the research, there's literally no definition for a general low carbohydrate diet, but it basically means that like you're, you're trying to limit your carbohydrate intake to somewhere between like 75 grams per day, upwards of 200 grams per day. All of that is housed under the low carbohydrate umbrella. Yeah. Good, right? good, good, good point. And, yeah. and now that I think about it, I mean, truly, I don't think there may have been some keto books way back, but I don't think the keto thing became a thing until like 2014, 2015. Before that, it was all paleo. Exactly right. So prior to keto, it was paleo. paleo. Prior to paleo, it was like the zone in the South Beach diet, which were not really like keto, where they were just sort of like low carbohydrate-ish. Prior to that, it was Atkins. So Atkins was the original popular ketogenic program back in the 90s yeah. that everybody was talking about as being the next, the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. So it wasn't that easy to find that nor, but if, if we had to go backwards in time and you were to say, Hey Cyrus, you're going to eat a ketogenic diet in order to suppress your glucose and insulin. I would have been like, no, there's no way. Cause intuitively a ketogenic diet is a terror. My brain just won't do it. I, I just can't do it. And I knew that that was not a recipe for ideal health, but yet the low carbohydrate thing that I was doing wasn't like full blown keto. And for some reason I could justify that when in reality I learned that that was actually a pretty bad idea too. Yeah. So let's, I, I like that we're talking about fat. I want to talk about fat a little bit longer here. Yeah. So on the mastering diabetes, green light, yellow light, red light, program which indicates to people which foods you can like eat green like unlimited amounts of right yeah. yellow you want to be cautious red let's let's put the brakes on these guys mm -hmm. um, what percent fat are we talking about when you say a low fat whole food plant-based diet great call great call okay when we say low fat plant-based whole food diet all three of those terms mean something low fat has a very specific definition Plant-based has a very specific definition and whole food has a very specific definition. Okay. Talk to me about all three. Okay. Low fat means 10 to 15% of your diet contains fat. 10 to 15% of your diet. Sorry, let me back up. 10 to 15% of the total calories that you're consuming on a daily basis should come from fat. 10 to 15% of the total calories you're consuming on a daily basis should come from protein. And the remainder, which is between 70 and 80% of your calories should come from carbohydrate. Okay. So you can call it a low fat. You can call it low fat, low protein. You can call it high carbohydrate. I don't care what you call it. It doesn't really matter. The point is that we're looking at either somewhere between like 70, 15, 15 or 80, 10, 10. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. yep. And then plant-based whole food. Okay. So that's low fat plant-based plant-based is this umbrella term that basically means eat a lot of plant material, eat as much plant material as you possibly can. If you choose to be a hundred percent vegan and eliminate all animal products, by all means, I'll give you a high five. I think it's a great decision. Okay. But if you say, Cyrus, I don't want to do that. I still want to eat some eggs. I still want to have a little bit of cheese. I still want to eat, you know, a, a turkey burger here and there. I want to have some, a, a red meat here and there. My answer to you is, listen, I'm not the food police. You do whatever you want to do. I'm going to hear I'm going to educate you. And at that point, you're the one that decides what you want. So if you're going to eat a plant-based diet, I would say eat at least a minimum of 90% of all your calories that come from plant material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, herbs and spices, mushrooms, leafy green vegetables. Get your nutrition and your calories from there. If you have the occasional animal-based product, that's on you. Yeah. Yeah. What about whole foods? Okay. Whole foods, either completely unprocessed or minimally processed. 
Okay. So if you were to walk out into a, a jungle or you were to walk out into the forest and try and live for a week with no food on you, what would you eat? Okay. You'd probably eat the stuff that you could find. You'd look for things that are growing on trees. You'd look for things that are growing on bushes. You might, I don't know, might try digging something up underneath the ground. Okay. Or you might try and hunt something. Okay. And if you did try and hunt something, the truth is that number one, hunting is real hard. Okay. And number two, if you did manage to kill something and eat it, it would only provide you with a small amount of calories and you would spend the bulk of your time trying to find other food because you'd realize that it, the cost benefit analysis is like not in your favor. Okay. So hunting is extremely hard, but gathering and collecting would be a lot easier. So point being in, in the world in which we live today, it's really easy to go get a bunch of convenience foods. It's also really easy to go get a bunch of, you know, meat and, um, you know, dairy products that you find in the grocery store because they're subsidized and they're relatively inexpensive. But what we tell you to do is eat as much whole plant material as possible. Whole meaning you picked it from a tree, it sat on a shelf and you put it in your mouth and it required zero cooking, zero grinding, zero smoothieing, zero blending, nothing. Perfect example, all fruit. You don't have to do anything to fruit. You just open it up and you eat it and it's good. Okay. Uh, minimal processing would be things like legumes. Okay. You take legumes, whether it beans, uh, lentils or peas, and sometimes you got to cook them. Okay. So that's considered processing, but it's minimal processing and it doesn't require any refining process. Refining being, you know, extraction of certain ingredients and leaving other ingredients behind. Okay. So at all points in time, if you are eating a low fat diet that is primarily plant-based and as whole as possible, otherwise known as AWAP, as well as possible, then you are going to likely find that your overall chronic disease burden or your overall chronic disease risk goes down very quickly. And if you can continue that over the course of time and make it a sustainable collection of habits, then you're likely to uh, dramatically improve your quality of life and maybe even improve your longevity into the future. Mm. What about, so... Do you have people ever ask you, hey, Cyrus, so that's a pretty low-fat diet. I mean, most yeah. Americans are probably consuming, I don't know, 35 to 60% of their calories from fat. It's one of the reasons why there's so, many, so much diabetes. Yep. But our brains, my man, are 60% fat. So don't I need fat to, to feed my brain fat? <laughs> I mean, wh okay. what's your answer to that? Okay, here's my answer to that. My answer is don't confuse structure with function. Okay. People do this all the time. Okay. I'm going to give you an analogy. Your car, your car is made of metal and glass and rubber. Okay. Yeah. But that's the infrastructure of your car. What do you put in your car to make it run? You put fuel in your car. You put unleaded gasoline or diesel gasoline, or well, you I put, put metal and glass and plastic. <laughs> right. You're not going to go to the lumber yard and, or, or you're not going to go to like the scrap metal yard and find a bunch of scrap metal and be like, Hey, Toyota, how come you're not running off of this stuff? Right. It doesn't matter. The structure is built of certain material and the function is different because the function requires unleaded gasoline in order to move. Same thing with your brain. Okay. Your brain is primarily fatty acids and cholesterol. We know this is fatty acids, cholesterol, and it's nervous tissue bundled into this massive supercomputer. Okay. Just because your brain is primarily composed of fatty acids and cholesterol does not mean that your brain feeds on fatty acids and or cholesterol. From a physiological perspective, your brain has one preferred fuel. And that one preferred fuel is glucose. Right. And the people in the ketogenic world love to debate this ad nauseum and tell you that ketone bodies are the most effective fuel for your brain, blah, 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 blah. But the truth is that your, if you open any physiological textbook and you read it, it will, it'll, it'll show you over and over and over again that your brain prefers glucose. Your brain has all the enzymatic machinery and the physiological function to use glucose as your primary fuel source. Yeah. And there's so many backup mechanisms inside of your liver and inside of your muscle to ensure that your brain gets an adequate supply of glucose at all times. And that is without question, the most powerful fuel for your brain. I think where there's a little bit of confusion is because you hear that with growing infants, they need a certain amount of fat in their diet until mm -hmm. they're about two years of age. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, it, I mean, your 10 to 15% is like, all you need, right? That, that's a true statement. That's a true. So, so breast milk is like a perfect example um, of how the, uh, 
the, the nutritional content of, sorry, the nutritional content of breast milk changes over the course of time as the child develops and gets older. Right. It's fascinating, right? So somehow the mother's breast recognizes the age of the child and then alters its composition of fatty acids and protein and uh, carbohydrate in order to meet that child's nutritional requirements. It's mind boggling. It is. So do you know, because I know that the fat and carbohydrate change, does the protein change? Because my understanding is mother's breast milk is about 4.8% protein. By okay. Count. So you, I don't know the actual numbers in, in, uh, off the top of my head, but I do believe the protein content does change over the course of time. It might not be as large of a, of yeah. a swing in magnitude yeah. um, as carbohydrate and fat is, but I do believe the protein requirements change slightly. Yeah, we'll have to look into that. Yeah, for sure. We can look at we what can super geek on that. So I'm um, uh, yeah. So I'm 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 trying to dive into fat here. Mm -hmm. So what about what about um, fatty? Uh, like so, all these um, vitamins like A, D, K that are fat soluble. Yeah. Do we need like a, a minimal amount of fat in our diets? to uh, basically allow our bodies to absorb those vitamins? Is there any, like, is there any myth around, around the fact that, oh, if you're, you're vegan, you're not getting enough fat, you're not going to be able to absorb those fat-soluble vitamins? Yeah, exactly. So the fat-soluble vitamins are basically A, D, E, and K. Yeah. And the, the, the conversation in the world of social media and beyond is that in order to absorb a sufficient amount of A, D, E, and K, your, the fat content of your diet has to be medium to high. Otherwise, you're not going to get enough and things are going to go wrong. What do but you say to that? that? <laughs> What's that? What do you say to that? Yeah, the truth is that if you look in the research, that's not what the research says. Okay? So beta carotene is an example. Okay? Beta carotene is a fat-soluble vitamin that um, you can absorb beta carotene in large quantities. It's very bioavailable with as little as five grams of fat per day in children. Mm. Okay, we're not talking large amounts. So again, this idea that you have to have a medium fat diet or high fat diet in order to get a sufficient amount of that, it's from a mathematical perspective, that's not true. Okay. Um, other studies in children have shown that um, 2.4 grams of fat per meal or as, as much as 21 grams of fat per day is sufficient for optimal absorption and utilization of vitamin A. And that's nothing. That's nothing. That's yeah. a very small amount. Yeah. Right. So what we're saying, like, but can you put, like, can you, for the listeners that are like, well, what does 21 grams of fat look like? Can you put that into perspective for us? For, for sure. Okay. So 21 grams of fat. Let's, let's actually pull up. Cause I don't know these numbers off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open Google right here. Yeah. Let's do it. Ask me that question one more time in a second. Yeah, I will. But like, I'm just thinking and, um, for example, a, um, let me think like oats. Yep. I know that oats are about 18% fat, right? But, but, uh, a serving size, 18% fat, 18% carbohydrates. And the remaining mm -hmm. is coming from carbohydrates. But I would like to know if I have a, like a, a bowl of oatmeal in the morning, let's say a cup or two cups mm -hmm. of oatmeal in the morning, how many grams of fat am I getting from that oatmeal? Okay, perfect. So the, to answer any one of these questions here about specific foods, all you have to do is download our preferred app is called chronometer. Yeah. You can also get my fitness pal. You can get any number of different apps here that have the USDA nutrient database inside of it. And then you can basically just say, Hey, how much does one cup of oats yield me? Right? So I'm looking at chronometer right now on my screen and I see that one cup of oats gives you 55 grams of carbohydrate. 55, yeah. 55 grams of carbohydrate, which is awesome. And yes. 5.3 grams of fat. 5.3. 5.3 grams of fat. So basically, yeah. 10 to 1 ratio, 11 to 1 ratio of carbohydrate to, to fat. Right. Okay. Right. So what we were talking about earlier is we said, you know, in children, as much as 2.5 grams of fat per meal or as much as 21 grams of fat per day is enough for sufficient beta carotene absorption and utilization. Okay. So it's, it, it really doesn't take that much. If we took a look at avocado as an example, this is another, you know, popular food that people love to uh, consume. 
Is that, a yellow, is that a yellow, a yellow light food or a red light on mastering diabetes? It is a yellow light food because it's a, it's a higher fat plant food yeah. that we absolutely don't, um, we don't say you can't eat it in, by any stretch of imagination. Go ahead and eat it, but just realize that when you consume avocados, it easily contributes to your total fat content throughout the day. And over the course of time can make you more insulin resistant without you even knowing it. Right. So you don't want people to abuse that. <laughs> exactly. A little bit goes a long way. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Perfect example. One avocado. Okay. One medium avocado, which I realize is not an objective measurement. But can I guess? Can case. I guess? Uh, uh, let me guess. Go. Right. I am going to say it's probably about a thousand calories a pound. One medium is probably so it's five hundred calories. Of that, eighty percent of it is fat. Okay. So if I got five hundred calories, eighty percent. Uh, let's just say is, let me say 400. That would be, there's 10 times. So is it 40? So you're thinking about 40 grams of fat per avocado. Yeah. But that seems like too much. Is it 20? Is it, yeah, cut it 40? Okay. Cut it 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah. 21, 20. Right. And your math was very close, except it has 225 grams. I'm sorry, 225 calories instead of 500. All right. That's where I blew it then. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So point being is that one avocado yields you approximately 20 grams of fat yeah. and gives you approximately 12 grams of carbohydrate energy. Okay. So what we suggest to people is you're going to have about 10 to 15% of your uh, calories from fat for the day in order to maintain optimal insulin sensitivity today and into the future. Mm -hmm. And that translates into approximately 25 to 30 grams of fat per day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not really that much. But the truth is that when you're eating a lot of fruits, a lot of starchy vegetables, a lot of whole grains, and a lot of uh, legumes, then your total fat content is low de facto because that's how – that's the, the macronutrient distribution of those foods. Yeah, It's just that simple, right? So you don't have to – if you're eating those foods, you're – macronutrient profile will be approximately 70, 15, 15, or maybe even 80, 10, 10, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to try. If you want to add some fat to your foods into your diet, okay, go for it. Not a problem. But just like we said, a little bit can go a long way. Do you feel like diabetes for you is a disability? No, diabetes is a superpower. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. I, we literally have. I love it. A podcast love it. episode called um, "Why Diabetes Is My Superpower," and um, I'll tell you this. And I'm not just saying this for like marketing purposes or anything. I truly do believe this. I was given diabetes for a reason. Okay, I am a puppet. My goal is to go through the process of living with diabetes so that I can learn everything I possibly can about it and help as many people as possible. That is, I do believe that that is what I was put on this planet for. And I, and I strongly believe that. Now, if I did not have diabetes, I would be eating the same diet, most likely, that I ate when I was 20 years old prior to being diagnosed. And trust me, that diet was not awesome. It was not healthy. So th that diet likely would have led to other chronic diseases. I may have developed hypertension. I may have high cholesterol. I may become overweight. I may develop the same standard American condition that so many other Americans are living with, right? Um, so being diagnosed with diabetes was actually a gateway for me to be able to enter into the world of health and study and break it all the way down to its building blocks and then build it all the way back up and try and figure out what the heck true health actually is. Wow. And in that process, I'm healthier. I'm, I'm easily 10 times healthier than I was back in the day. Without question, no, no, no questions asked. And what allows me to go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning and feel good about myself and my life is that I'm trying to help out as many people as possible so that they can also get the same results, if not better results by doing something very similar to what I've done. So you are so grateful that you got type one diabetes. It, yes, I, I am truly grateful and I love living with type one diabetes and not only that, people ask me, they're like, hey, man, uh, when artificial pancreases come around, are you going to get one? You know, when, when you can get a beta cell transplant and it can last you for the rest of your life, you're going to get that? When there's a cure to type 1 diabetes, you're going to get that? And my answer is probably not. 
I have no desire. I literally have no desire. I, I don't actually want type one diabetes to go away. I think I want to have type one diabetes till the day I die because it is fascinating and it, I'm always learning new things and it helps me, uh, stay accountable to my lifestyle and it helps me help other people at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, you know, having spent several days with you and Robbie, you know, living at our house for, you know, a couple of days and watching how you guys eat and how you monitor your, um, your blood glucose levels. Mm -hmm. It is, it's incredible to me how it also is a disease that it keeps you on your toes Yeah, and you can't, you know, type, maybe type two is different, but with type one, which I think we should let everybody know that type one affects what percent of the population? Yeah. Good question. Type one affects a total of between two and 4 million people in the United States alone. And there's 350 million people. So what's the math on that? It's yeah. like, I think I've heard it's like 3%. I mean, sure. Single digit right. percentage. Yes. And, and type two represents what? 80% of the diabetes that's out there. Is type two represents, um, sorry, pre-diabetes and type two together yep. represent 92% of the diabetes population. Okay. So yep. majority. Okay. But so in, in so in anyway, l getting the privilege to see how you and Robbie live with type one diabetes, it's, it's something else. Um, and it makes me not for one second take for granted mm -hmm. that that I have this ability where my body can, you know, register exactly what's going on and generate the perfect amount of insulin and all this stuff. And, you know, you guys, you're, you're, you're taking shots and you're, you're bolus and, you know, you're, you're long acting insulin, you're short acting insulin. Right. I mean, and it is, it, it's ever present. And so many people I think that are living with type one and type two, almost view it as a monster, right? Why, why me? And I love the way you guys are trying to reframe the whole conversation in that, you know, diabetes is you, you are diabetes, and this can be a really great gift. Yes, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because it, it is to a certain point, to a certain extent, it is a full-time job. There's no question about that. And you can't really let your guard down because if you do, then like, you know, yeah, you can make a mistake. Um, speaking of mistakes, when I was hanging out at your place, like I'll be very open and honest about this. I was hanging out at your place. I woke up one morning and my blood glucose was lower than it should have been, right? I woke up in a hypoglycemic state because I made a mistake from the night before and I gave myself the, the, no, the, the normal amount of long acting insulin, but it turns out I was so insulin sensitive from hanging out with you and getting in the swimming pool and going to the gym and, you know, using our bodies all the time. Pickleball. Don't forget the pickleball and the pickleball. Don't. Yep. And oh. as a result of that, my blood glucose was low the next morning and you saw it. I was trying to have a conversation with you and I made absolutely no sense. And you turned to me and you were like, Cyrus, come downstairs with me right now. We're going to the kitchen. And you started feeding me dates and mangoes. And I started eating it and was like, what is going on? And then you told me your blood glucose is low. And I started to recognize that when my blood glucose became normal. And then I was like, oh my God, thank you for helping out. Right. So I am not infallible. I make mistakes here and there. Like there's no question about it. The goal when living with pre diabetes and type 2 diabetes is to eat a, a diet, a nutrient dense, plant based, low fat, whole food diet and use that as your primary chronic disease reversal tool, mm -hmm. okay? And it reverses prediabetes and a lot of other comorbidities that come along for the ride. Same thing with type 2 diabetes. Now, if you're living with type 1 diabetes, the idea is to use that same diet or that same lifestyle to control your blood glucose with precision and make it such that your blood glucose variability is very low your A1C value is very low and the quality of your life is extremely high. The last thing I'll say about this is that people with type one diabetes, when they are first diagnosed are scared, they're scared because they go from being a normal individual to somebody who has to inject insulin multiple times per day, every single time they eat and monitoring their blood glucose 24 hours a day. It's not easy to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, medical professionals often inadvertently scare people even more without knowing it because they tell people things like, well, if you have type one diabetes, 
your, your lifespan is going to be cut by 10 years right off the bat. So just subtract 10 years off the end of your life. And you're like, what? I just lost 10 years off my life. Are you kidding me? And then they tell you things like, well, you're going to have to go on a statin medication at some point in your life. You're going to have to go on blood pressure medication at some point in your life. You might lose, you might develop retinopathy in your, uh, in your eyes. You might develop, uh, uh, nephropathy inside of your kidneys, right? You might get a limb amputated over the course of time, right? And you're like, what, what is going on, right? And so they tell you these things because statistically speaking, that's what happens to people with type 1 diabetes. If you, eat, if, you, if you have type 1 diabetes and you look in the data, you'll find out that people who have that and people who generally eat a low-carbohydrate diet end up with a whole collection of ancillary problems down the road. Yeah. So they scare you into believing that that's just a byproduct of type one when in reality it's not, it's a byproduct of type one that is poorly managed using primarily pharmaceutical medications and a low nutrient quality diet. Yeah. If instead you're living with type one diabetes and you maximize your nutrient density and eat as plant-based as possible, then you can minimize the risk of any of those other future chronic diseases from even setting in. You can kiss them goodbye in most situations and you can maximize the quality of your life. That's the message. Yeah. What I realized to being around you and Robbie for three days was how, like you said, this can almost be like a full-time job that yeah. you got to stay on top of, right? Yes. And so I want you to talk for a second about the community that you and Robbie have, have formed over the last several years that allows people with type one, type two, 1.5, you name it. And you can get the coaching and the attention that you need to totally master this disease. So you don't have to get afflicted with the ancillary, right? You know, the, the, the retinopathy, the neuropathy, the, you know, amputation of limbs, the kidney failure, going on a statin medication, all the things you just talked about right. that are, that are really, um, Almost, it seems unavoidable if you don't transition to a whole food plant-based diet. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for bringing this up because when I was first diagnosed with diabetes and I was going through the process for the first, call it decade of living with type one, trying to like figure it out and learn the research and like optimize my own health, um, I began to realize that I felt like an island. Like I didn't really know that many other people who are living with type one, you know, after many years of living with type one diabetes. And, um, I certainly didn't know people who were living with type one diabetes and were happy. I'll tell you that because the world of type one is filled with a bunch of people who, uh, have suboptimal health. And a lot of people, just like you mentioned earlier, a lot of people complain about the fact that they are yeah. developing other health conditions over the course of time. It's not their fault, but that's just what happens. Right. And so as I was going through this process, I was like, man, why is there not an uplifting and inspirational community of people who are going through the process of living with all forms of diabetes together that can help one another out and that are acting on credible scientific information? Okay. I'm not in, I'm not interested in your opinion. I'm not interested in your emotions about what you think is the right opinion. I mean, I am, but <laughs> what I'm interested in is the science. So let's create a scientific basis and then add a community on top of that. And that's what Mastering Diabetes is. So we created the scientific basis that forms the Mastering Diabetes Method. The Mastering Diabetes Method has four components. A low-fat plant-based whole food diet, daily activity, intermittent fasting when necessary, and the fourth thing is daily documentation of all the habits that you're doing and what effect they have on your blood glucose. Mm. If you follow the method exactly the way that we describe, your life with diabetes can be improved tenfold. And in most situations, we see the people living with prediabetes type two and gestational diabetes, they kiss it goodbye. It just literally disappears. And some people it could take two months and some people could take six months and some people it takes three years. Yeah. It depends on your habits. It depends on your disease history. But the idea here is that when you target the root, which is insulin resistance, and you get rid of that insulin resistance, you become insulin sensitive. You develop a superpower that even your non-diabetic friends don't have. Hmm. And when you develop that superpower, not only does diabetes fade away into the background, but so does high blood pressure, so does high cholesterol, so does the early signs of dementia, so does cardiovascular disease, so does obesity, and the list goes on. 
you know, I've even heard Cyrus that, that, um, that Alzheimer's is like type three diabetes. Right. Have you, have you heard anything like that? Absolutely. That's exactly what it's being coined as, um, in today's world. So Alzheimer's. Can you, can you speak to that for a sec? For sure. So, uh, Dean and Aisha Sherzai, who are very good friends of mine and good friends of yours, um, are Please. the world's experts yeah. in um, understanding the causes and the effects of what they call vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things that their research has brought to light that they've educated me on ad nauseum is the fact that dementia has classically been thought of as an inevitable consequence of some type of genetic issue. Okay, so it's either a genetic issue that you inherited from your parents or it's the accumulation of these mysterious plaque molecules that somehow, you know, make their way into neurons inside of your brain that just decrease your cognitive ability and make it so that you end up with dementia and then your life kind of fades away into the background. Okay. The truth is that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are strongly influenced by what you eat and they're strongly influenced by what you eat early in life. So even though they generally set in in people who are 60, 70, 80 and beyond, what you're eating as a 20 year old mm. matters. What you're eating as a 30 year old matters because it is setting the stage for what's happening inside of your brain that may take many, many, many years to develop that could turn into a dementia or Alzheimer's state in the future. Right? So type three diabetes is the term for Alzheimer's disease in today's world because the cellular mechanism of cognitive decline inside of your brain in Alzheimer's disease is insulin resistance of your brain. Mm. It is fascinating. So the story that we told earlier is insulin resistance inside of your liver and inside of your muscle. Everything about eating that triglyceride molecule and insulin knocking on the door and not being able to get glucose in and that, that is a true statement. None of that is uh, you know, up for debate. But insulin resistance can affect your brain, and when it affects your brain for a long period of time, it can then progress into dementia, which can then progress into Alzheimer's disease. And once you're at that state, it can be very challenging to try and recover. If, if I don't even know if it's possible mm -hmm. at this point. So the name of the game when it comes to dementia and Alzheimer's disease is prevent, prevent, prevent. And that's what you can do today so that you can avoid the transition to type 3 diabetes into the future. Okay. Thank you. You also mentioned two other pillars of the mastering diabetes kind of formula. Correct. You mentioned exercise and you mentioned intermittent fasting. Correct. Can you talk to me about those two things and how they're related to, I guess, mastering uh, insulin resistance? For sure. Um, do you have another six hours maybe? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, obviously, I want you to do this in a way that is uh, time sensitive. <laughs> yeah, you're like 30 seconds, go. <laughs> okay, so um, you're right. Daily movement and intermittent fasting are two pillars of the four pillar mastering diabetes method. Daily movement is the first. Okay, so daily movement is very effective because movement stimulates insulin sensitivity. Okay. There's, we could, we could talk for hours about exactly what's happening inside of your muscle tissue when you move and how that influences insulin glucose to behave inside of your muscle. And, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating story, but it would take literally multiple yeah. hours to go through. The most important thing that I want people to take away from this is when it comes to movement, okay? when you move your musculature, whether it's through endurance exercise or resistance exercise or some combination of the two of those. Okay whether it's by getting in the swimming pool and trying to keep up with rip, which is, trust me, ladies and gentlemen, impossible. I've tried it. It doesn't work. Okay. Or whether you're going to the gym and you're trying to do a resistance class and just trying to move, you know, um, with resistance based movement. And trust okay. me, I've tried that with Cyrus and it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So regardless of the type of exercise you're performing, when the exercise, what it does is it mechanically, uh, forces your muscle tissue to expand and contract hundreds, if not thousands of times within a given session. Okay. So that mechanical, uh, work that's being performed by muscle tissues requires energy. So the energy has to come from somewhere. The energy that your muscles used, um, at the beginning parts of exercise come from the thing that it's already storing. It has two fuel tanks. 
Number one, glycogen, which is a stored form of glucose. And number two, the, the, li the lipid droplets we talked about earlier, the triglyceride that's actually inside of your muscle tissue. So high urine intensity exercises uses more glycogen, more glucose. Lower intensity exercises in general use more fatty acids. But point being, those are the two storage, fuel storage warehouses that are built into your muscle tissue. And that's a good thing because then those muscles will have energy to be able to use during exercise. Now, when you are done with exercise, this is where the magic happens. When you're done with exercise, you have to refuel those muscle, I'm sorry, they refuel those fuel tanks, okay? You got to put more glucose back into the glycogen granule. You got to put more fatty acids back into that lipid storage depot, okay? The beauty is that you can get glucose inside of your muscle tissue either for free with zero insulin or for a drastically reduced uh, amount of insulin. Okay. That's the key. So under normal circumstances, if it would take, let's say five units of insulin to get a bunch of glucose into your musculature and store it properly after exercise, that five units of insulin could come down to something like three or maybe even two and a half. Isn't that, isn't that it, it, it's so fascinating because when I look back on my triathlon career and after a hard exercise session you know we always heard about this golden window of about 20 to 30 minutes uh -huh. when after exercise you want to eat a you know a nice amount of carbohydrates uh so that you can store as many as much glycogen as you can in that window right. of time after exercise so Anyway, even in healthy people, you know, with yes, with without insulin resistance, it sounds like there's uh, there's some benefits as well. Absolutely. So you're right. Even in healthy individuals. So your perfect example. You don't have diabetes. We don't want you to ever have it. Yeah. So the amount of work that your beta cells have to perform in order to manufacture insulin goes down because your muscles just don't need as much insulin. Mm -hmm. So you're able to store the same amount of glucose for less insulin for like 40 to 50, sometimes even more of a reduction in insulin use. And that's a good thing mm -hmm. because you are sensitizing your muscle tissue um, to insulin. So less insulin goes, uh, does the same amount of work. Okay. So when it comes to exercise, the reason why we tell people to use their body on a daily basis is because when you use your body and you use it consistently, you are constantly stimulating insulin sensitivity in your musculature and that allows glucose to easily enter your muscle tissue and get out of your blood and that keeps your blood glucose low that's a good thing yeah are you um are you as shredded or more shredded today than you were when you were uh you know 22 in 2022 in 2022 2002 2002 2002, 2002. no 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 sorry I am more shredded, if you will. I have more muscle mass. I have more endurance, more strength, more power today than I had when I was 22 years old, without question. Can you show me those guns? These guns right here? You can't really see it in this lighting, but maybe you can. Oh, I can, I, I can see them. <laughs> a little bit right here. I mean, <laughs> I enjoy working out with you because um, when I try and get in the summer, I mean, Rip, you're a, you're a, you're a gold medal Sorry, no, 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 not gold medal. You have a world record in the 200 meter backstroke, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, I have firsthand experience trying to get in the pool and do anything with Rip. And I gave up after about 30 seconds because this man is a complete machine. And watching you swim is like pure art. Like this guy's a freaking fish in the water. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but the beauty here is that you have trained your every muscle in your body and your brain to operate at like peak performance to be able to like be as efficient as you possibly can in the water. And watching that is just, it's pure art, but it's also a perfect example of you don't even recognize what's happening inside of your muscle tissue after the fact. I mean, we're just describing one biological mechanism mm -hmm. that has to do with glucose and insulin, but there are hundreds of biological mechanisms that are happening simultaneously before, during, and after exercise that are fascinating. But as far as chronic disease prevention is concerned, by being active in the swimming pool and by being active in the gym and by moving your body and going on walks and running and hiking, and biking and swimming and doing whatever you want to do, you can keep your muscle tissue extremely sensitive to insulin 
And that over the course of many days, months, and years is going to lead to a dramatic reduction in chronic disease risk. Yeah. So with the people that are part of your Mastering Diabetes community, do you tell them, you know, get out and move two to three times a day? Do you have a certain like prescription? For, for it's, it's so easy. 30 minutes per day. That's it. That's the only real requirement. So 30 minutes per day, use your body and um, try and exercise at a point where you can't sing your favorite Whitney Houston song. <laughs> and you also can't have a conversation with somebody because if you can do either one of those, then you're not working hard enough. You're not breathing hard enough. Yeah. Okay. So if you can do that and you can do that for once, I mean, you can take that 30 minutes and do it in one session, or you can break it up into three 10 minute sessions or two 15 minute sessions. I don't really care. But point being is get that movement in and that in addition to a low fat plant-based whole food diet will sensitize your muscle more than you can even uh, predict. You know, uh, I want to ask you about intermittent fasting. Yep. I'd love for you to talk to me about that for a sec. Again, it doesn't have to be, you know, an hour or two hours, but before we do, I want to say, say something. And I meant to mention this when we were talking about fat, but I found this to be extremely interesting in that there's something called the Hegstead equation. I'm sure you know, know it well, mm -hmm. and, and maybe you could tell us about it. Sure. So the Hegstead equation. Because I thought that saturated fat, I knew what it did for insulin resistance. I knew that it contributed to atherosclerosis, but it also does something else. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So the Hegstead equation is a mathematical equation that describes the relationship between saturated fat in your diet and your cholesterol level in your blood. It is fascinating. So this researcher named, uh, I don't know what his first name was. We'll call Probably him Heg Samuel. Samuel Hegstead. <laughs> Samuel Hegstead. Okay. Um, so he recognized over the course of his career as he was trying to understand more about cholesterol metabolism in, in particular, what influences your carbo, I'm sorry, what influences your cholesterol level inside of your blood? Okay. Does eating cholesterol influence your cholesterol level? Does eating carbohydrate influence your cholesterol level? Does eating saturated fat, does eating unsaturated fat, you tell me. So he did a whole collection of experiments. And what he found over the course of his career is that the, the relationship between uh, saturated fat and cholesterol was the strongest. And that if you wanted to increase your cholesterol level in your blood, nobody wants to do that. But let's say you wanted to do that. The simplest way to get that done would be to go eat saturated fat, not even eating cholesterol, which is fascinating. It is. Because the rhetoric is, oh, you want higher cholesterol? Go eat more cholesterol. You want lower cholesterol? Reduce your cholesterol intake. But the truth is that Hegstead said, no, no, no. If you want less cholesterol in your blood, you got to reduce your saturated fat intake. And, and what to me is, and so I read this when I was reading your book, and I mm -hmm. found that to be so fascinating. But Cyrus, here's the thing. Where do we find predominantly saturated fat and where is cholesterol only found? Okay. So cholesterol is truth be told. Cholesterol yeah. is found both in animal products and plant products. People keep on saying like cholesterol well, is not only much, found in animal not much in plants, right? Correct. Correct. It's found in like one, one hundredth the yeah. concentration in plant products as it is in animal products. So from a physiolog, anything that's physiologically relevant, um, foods that contain a significant amount of cholesterol come from the animal world. Like any animal based product you can think of, whether it's white meat, red meat, fish, chicken, poultry, it could be, uh, eggs, bacon, um, yeah. dairy products, milk, all of that, all of that contains cholesterol. Okay. It turns out that saturated fat and cholesterol tend to travel together. Yeah. Okay. They tend to be in the same foods in, uh, similar concentrations. And as a result of that, foods that are high in cholesterol tend to also be high in saturated fat and vice versa when it comes from the animal world. In the plant-based world, if you eat a food that's high in saturated, high urine saturated fat, as an example, like olive oil, okay? Most people think that olive oil has no saturated fat. That's not a true statement. It mm -hmm. contains a significant amount of saturated fat. Coconut oil is an even perfect example. Coconut oil is predominantly saturated fat, but there is- 91%, baby. <laughs> How much? 91%. 91% saturated fat, but zero cholesterol. Yeah. Okay. Or effectively zero cholesterol. Right. Right. Okay? So, the, the, so, so cholesterol and saturated fat are BFFs. Yes, they are absolutely BFFs. <laughs> That's a great way to think about it. <laughs> now, yeah. if anybody's interested, go look up the Hegstead equation. It's called H-E-G 
S T E D. And this is literally a mathematical model, mathematical equation that specifically it'll predict how the saturated fat in your diet and the cholesterol in your blood are related to one another. And you can map it out on a piece of paper and you can figure out a way to actually lower your cholesterol just by reducing your saturated fat content. All right. This is what I I've made a, 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 a game day decision here. Do it on the move. And that is, I don't want to talk about intermittent fasting because that's something I'd love to actually say for another day with you Cool. Right? and some other things cool. but before we leave and I let you get back to your family. I would love to ask you a couple more questions that don't require as lengthy of a uh, explanation or answer. So the first one is, I'm assuming it won't. And that is, I, it's, I think so many people today are worried about, you know, what's the glycemic, uh, you know, index or number of this fruit or vegetable or, or whatever, or thing that I'm eating. It, do you guys buy into the glycemic index? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Okay. Great question. The answer is we don't, the glycemic index only really matters when you're already insulin resistant. Okay. Wow. If you're not insulin resistant, the that glycemic is, index doesn't that is, really that matter. That is so important. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. The glycemic index only really matters when you're already living with insulin resistance. If you are not insulin resistant, then the glycemic index doesn't really matter. Oh my God. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. And so, and so yeah. So, uh, yeah. So let's say that I am not insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about, you know, how much sugar is, uh, sugar, we're talking about sugar, right? When we say glycemic index. Yeah. So really what you're talking about is basically the glycemic index measures how the speed or how quickly a food will raise your blood glucose level. It's literally a, um, a measure of velocity. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. So it measures the speed at which a given food will raise your blood glucose level. And the foods that are highest on the glycemic index are actually, truth be told, is pure glucose. Okay. It's at 100 or dextrose, we'll call it that. Okay. Um, Foods that are considered low glycemic have a, have a rating of 55 or less on this scale. Medium glycemic is basically 56 to 69. And then high glycemic is basically 70 and above. Okay. Now here's the kicker. The glycemic index is basically meant to be something that's useful for people. So I can take a look at a piece of food and be like, oh, okay, that's either low, medium, or high. Yeah. I want to try and eat either like medium or low as much as possible and try and avoid or eliminate all high glycemic foods. But here's the problem. The glycemic index is a measurement of one food in isolation at any given moment in time. Okay. How many times do you eat a meal that contains one food and one food only? Does that happen? Very rarely. Very rarely. Okay. The food that you eat is put into a thing called a meal and a meal usually contains multiple different foods at the same time. You might have a little bit of rice with some potatoes and then in addition to that, some green beans, okay? That's multiple foods acting at the same time. So the glycemic index of any one of those foods is effectively diluted by the other foods that are also present in that meal. That's point number one. Number two, the glycemic index is also, it changes in a given food depending on the temperature at which the food is eaten, depending on how it was cooked, depending on how ripe it is, and depending on the variety of the food itself. So there's so many things that factor into the actual true glycemic index of a food that because of that, it's really hard to just look on, a, on, a, on, a, on the internet and be like, oh, I'm eating this red potato. What is the glycemic index of it? Because that doesn't take into account, is it baked? Is it fried? Does it have oil on it? Was it, was it prepared and then cooled? Because that matters, right? Is it chopped up? Is it blended or is it not blended? Like all of these things matter. And so as a result of that, the glycemic index is just like, uh, it, it's too confusing. The first thing I said was that the glycemic index only really matters if you're insulin resistant. And the reason we say that, the reason this is a true statement is because if you are insulin resistant, what that means is that you have low carbohydrate tolerance. Your, the ability of your digestive system to tolerate carbohydrate is very low because of this excess, you know, this, uh, excess stored saturated fat inside of your liver and muscle and the, the traffic jam that has resulted. So in that state, 
if you try and add foods that are higher on the glycemic index, good luck. It's not going to work. Your glucose will go high. There's no question about it. Hmm. So the way to eat foods that are higher on the glycemic index is to first become insulin sensitive. You have to do that first. You put, don't put the cart before the horse. Make sure that you become insulin sensitive first. If you do that, then you can eat higher glycemic index foods to your heart's content, assuming that they're whole foods. And then you don't have to worry about that scale in any way. Yeah. And now you're like you and Robbie eating 400 to 500 grams of carbohydrates a day. More, 700 plus. <laughs> 700. 700. Sorry about that. Yeah, That's right. no worries. That's right. That's right. Five, six X, which you were doing when you were 22 in 2002. Right. And, and the truth is that a lot of the carbohydrates that we eat tend to be higher on the glycemic index scale, right? We're talking about things like mangoes and dates and bananas. And most people with diabetes wouldn't even, they can't even look at those foods because those foods are going to make raise their blood glucose. Again, the reason is because they're already insulin resistant. Yeah. But if they became insulin sensitive, then they could eat those foods and they could eat them in large quantities. The glucose would stay nice and stable and life would be totally different. So the moral of the story here is get to the root causation of everything yep. by eating the way we're talking about here. And then you can kiss goodbye, the glycemic index and all these other things. That's exactly um, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. You good for two more questions? Let's do it. All right. All right. Um, what are your thoughts on gluten? And, and I'm talking specifically for people with diabetes. Should they st stay away from gluten or it doesn't matter? Or once you're, you know, you're insulin sensitive again, does it unlock the key and now we can do what we want? What do you think? Okay. So gluten is, has become like a, a pretty large conversation in the world of health overall today, both for people with diabetes and people who don't have diabetes. And now, there are, there's a, there's a, there's a condition called celiac disease, which is basically a autoimmune gluten intolerance. If you have celiac disease, by all means, do not touch gluten. Okay. Gluten comes from four primary sources, wheat, barley, uh, rye, and spelt. Okay. Those are the four places where you're most likely to find gluten. Okay. So if you have celiac, don't touch those foods by any stretch of imagination. And a lot of people have to be very careful about eating food that was processed in a facility that also contained gluten right? Yeah. It's like, it's pretty gnarly. Okay. Uh, celiac affects 2% of the population or less. Okay. 98% of the population does not have celiac, does not actually have a frank gluten intolerance. Okay. So that is a good thing. And that means that if you don't have a gluten intolerance or you haven't been diagnosed with celiac disease, then you're in the majority of the population. And that's a good thing. Now, um, again, if you, if you eat a plant-based diet, um, it, is, it is actually very simple to either have a small amount of gluten or to actually be gluten-free. Because if you eat a plant-based diet, but you just don't eat wheat products, which is not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. If you don't have barley in your diet, which is not that hard to do. I don't eat barley, okay? I don't eat rye. <laughs> if you don't eat rye and you don't eat spelt, then de facto, you're pretty much gluten-free at that point, right? Just make sure your oats are, are, um, aren't contaminated, right? They're gluten-free. That's exactly right. Yeah. So the truth is that when people talk about eating a gluten-free diet and people struggle with it and people are like, oh God, it's so hard. You don't understand. I have to buy all these products that are gluten-free mm -hmm. and I have to be a detective everywhere I go. A lot of the times I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, I think you're overcomplicating this. I think you could just get away with eating a plant-based diet that doesn't contain wheat, barley, spelt, or rye. And you would be effectively gluten-free. And again, this is like paramount to what we've been talking about. Whole food, whole food, whole food. If you eat packaged and processed products that come from the freezer section or the refrigerated section in your grocery store, then you have to be a detective about whether it contains gluten or not. If you go to the produce section and you pick up an apple, 100% guarantee there's no gluten in it. If you pick up a potato, 100% guarantee there's no gluten in it, right? So I just want people to recognize that like gluten insensitivity is no joke. There's no question about it. I'm not trying to demean that in any way, shape, or form or diminish that. But if you want to eat a low gluten diet, by all means, it's very doable. And if you don't want to eat a gluten diet or low gluten diet, then you can also do that as well. And you can include wheat, barley, spelt, or rye inside of a plant-based regimen. And I got to say, I, I, again... 
when you get to see firsthand how you and Robbie mm-hmm. live this life and how clean it is and how and how literally whole food plant based it is like little to never do i see you guys eating anything out of a package if it's a can yeah it's a can of beans right no no salted you know kidney beans pinto beans whatever mm-hmm. um what did, what do we make for your your airplane oh. trip i think it was ki- chickpeas right it was chickpeas <laughs> the cheesy chickpeas <laughs> that's, right. that's right but it is incredibly whole food plant based and clean yep. so it 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 yeah um caffeine talk to me for a second about caffeine you know coffee teas are you a fan not a fan what do you think yeah so um, I've done a, a fair amount of reading here to try and figure out if there's a connection between, you know, is caffeine good for you, bad for you? Is it smart? Is it not smart? Because as you've probably seen, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of research that demonstrates that coffee, in particular, is actually uh, is actually beneficial for long term health. And I've even seen some articles that say people who consume, you know, three to five cups of coffee per day may live longer. Than their non caffeinated or their non coffee drinking counterparts. And I'm like, it's just like bonkers. I I don't understand that research, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. But here's the thing Um, I don't have any qualms necessarily against drinking caffeine. So um, personally, I don't use caffeine. I don't need caffeine. I don't want caffeine. And I I honestly don't think caffeine affects me because when I drink green tea, which is a relatively decent amount of caffeine, I can go to sleep within 15 minutes and I can stay asleep for hours at a time. So, Mm I don't think caffeine actually affects me in a way that it affects a lot of other people. Point being, it's not about me. This is about human health. Okay. Um, caffeinated beverages can, we've, we've found empirically that people who consume caffeine early in the morning have stranger blood glucose phenomenon later in the day. Mm. Okay. So if you drink caffeine in the morning, especially if it comes from coffee, then chances are somewhere in the middle of the afternoon, your glucose might be doing some weird things and it might be hard to piece that puzzle together. That's just a pure observation. I don't have any research to back that up. Okay. Um, when it comes to, you know, uh, if, if you choose to have caffeine in your diet, my answer is go for it. You can, you can totally do that. Um, that's on you and there's no problem with that. Um, but I would recommend that if you constructed a diet where you didn't need caffeine, that would be an optimal solution. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, the reason you're drinking caffeine in the first place is because caffeine is a neurological stimulant that gets your brain to be in a more active state. And the biological mechanism of that is long and complicated, but it effectively enables, um, what is it, cyclic AMP to be more active inside of your brain at all times. And that's a good thing, okay? Mm. So the point is that if you need caffeine in order to be awake, then I would say in the same way that we're going to the root cause of diabetes to figure out what's the problem, go to the root cause and try and figure out why do you need caffeine? If you need caffeine in order to stay awake, my answer would be to you, maybe there's some other aspect of your lifestyle that's not ideal. Maybe your diet could be more whole food plant-based. Maybe you could be doing a little bit more exercise. Maybe you are experiencing a significant amount of stress. You might want to reduce that. Okay. So I would say try and figure out what's the real source of the need for caffeine And if there is a real problem that's causing you to be excessively tired or chronically tired at all times, solve that problem first. So you don't think it has anything to do with me being up till 1.30 a.m. watching Stranger Things? Absolutely nothing to do with that. Good to know. know. That's a great show, by the way. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I would say that if you were watching the Die Hard trilogy over and over and over again, then that could definitely get you pretty tired because that is just adrenaline pumping at all time. And I get exhausted from watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I hear you loud and clear there. I, um, I've never, me. I've never been a coffee drinker, never mm-hmm. touched the stuff. And, um, I find the best way for me to wake up in the morning is just, you know, hit, uh, hit the swimming pool. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and, and exercise. And right. And, so, and I, so what happens to you when you exercise first thing in the morning, what does it do for you, you know, later in the morning or later in the day? Oh man. Well, cognitively. Yeah, it, uh, it gets me it grounds me for the day. I am pumped up. I'm on fire. Uh yep. I typically eat shortly thereafter and then I'm good. I mean, I I'm good until usually 2 or 3 and then maybe I'll go and I'll do some pull-ups or something like that. 
if I feel myself starting to fade a little bit uh-huh. and, then, and then I'm good again. So um, it's, it is, I guess it's my caffeine, right? Yeah. Exercise is your caffeine. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, my caffeine tends to be mangoes <laughs> or dates, <laughs> nice. right? Yeah. And, and what I have noticed too, is that uh, the moment I started consuming more fruit in my diet in particular, not just plant-based material, but fruit, yeah. Uh, my energy levels took a noticeable increase, a noticeable increase. So let me ask you this, because right now it's probably about five o'clock your time in the yep. afternoon. Yep. How many pieces of fruit would you say you've had already today? <laughs> okay, so the total number of fruit. So Robbie is actually in town and we're hanging out in person. So between Robbie and Kylie and myself, and then also Indigo, who's now like nine months old, um, we are eating an abnormally high amount of fruit, but that's a good thing. So in today in particular, I've probably eaten, without exaggeration, I've probably eaten eight mangoes, um, five bananas, and a handful of strawberries. So it's like eight plus five plus a handful of strawberries, call it like 15 pieces of fruit up till now. We haven't had dinner yet, and that's probably going to have another four to five pieces of fruit in it as well. And then what else have you eaten besides fruit today? Okay. What else have I eaten before this? I was eating a bowl of chickpeas. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Yeah. For those of you who don't know, I am obsessed with chickpeas. Uh, And so I eat those every single day without fail. Um, And then in addition to that, I also will eat potatoes. I also generally eat some, uh, some vegetables, some non-starchy vegetables for dinner time. That includes things like zucchini and or cauliflower and or broccoli because I love those foods. Mm. Um, sometimes I'll throw in some tomatoes. Sometimes there's some cucumber in there and then some leafy greens as well. So um, the bulk of my calories comes from fruits and chickpeas and potatoes. That's where I get calories from. And then the rest of the stuff is just there for like nutrient value and just because it's crunchy and tasty and you know easy to eat. Yeah. Um, and I'm telling you, everybody that's listening, mm-hmm. you got to witness. You got to see it firsthand to believe it. And you will, you will never look at a mango or a banana or a strawberry or a chickpea the same way again. <laughs> like, we, we, like after having you guys stay at our house for three days, we now can't get enough of those things. It's incredible the influence that you had, uh, not only on me, but also the whole family and the kids. Yeah. It, was really, it was really dynamic. So now Cole and Sophie and Hope are all, um, you know, we're, we're mango aholics. <laughs> Can't get enough. I, love it. I, love so I want to ask you just two more questions, really short, kind of quick ones. And then I'm going to let you get back to the, the mangoes. Um, <laughs> what is the worst thing about you having type one diabetes? Oh, great question. The worst thing about having type 1 diabetes is that uh, exactly what you witnessed in person. If I become too insulin sensitive because I'm super active Mm -hmm. and I don't actively back off on the amount of basal insulin I give myself at nighttime, I can drive myself like pretty darn dangerously low in the middle of the night. That's not a good thing, right? There has been some times when we were living back in San Francisco where I was like so low in the middle of the night that Kylie woke up. And she had to, uh, she had to like get some, like pour some honey into my mouth in order for me to like, you know, not pass out. Right. Terrible experiences, not fun. Emergency situations can't go to the hospital. Don't want to deal with that. So I have to be extremely militant about exactly how much basal insulin is going inside of me. And it's always a balance between how much activity have I had? Did I eat enough calories? How much dinner was, did I eat? Did I miss dinner for whatever reason? It's this long, sophisticated calculation in my head. Point being, when it doesn't go right, it's terrible. When it goes right, it's beautiful. So the thing about that, that to me would be scary is, let's say you're on the road and you're in a, ho- you're in a hotel room and you're all by yourself. Yeah. Do you have any kind of like redundancy set in place where somebody checks on you or a phone call or, or something? Because otherwise, if that got too low and you can't, have your wits about you enough to open the door and go out and you know it seems like you're 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 in trouble yeah you're a sitting duck yeah and the answer is 
So they have like continuous glucose monitors or CGMs that have alarms on them. So if your blood glucose does go low, it'll wake you up, right? That would be a useful tool for sure. I just don't happen to have one on me right now. Right. Another option is that sometimes when you start to go into that hypoglycemia threshold, my brain will wake me up. It'll literally cut my, my dream short and I'll pop awake. And, I, and I'll usually recognize that something is wrong because I'm extremely fidgety. Mm. And I'll have thoughts that are like darting all throughout my head and I can't make sense of anything. And then I usually like make these kind of rapid movements. And so I've trained myself to recognize when that's happening, to pick up a banana that's like hopefully not too far away and stick it in my mouth or take two or three of them and then just relax and wait, right? So in an ideal world, there would be somebody waiting there for me, but that's not always practical. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And what is the best thing about living with type 1 diabetes? The best thing about living with type 1 diabetes is that it is the greatest excuse to eat <laughs> the healthiest diet that you can possibly eat. Okay. It is, it is literally the best excuse to become the healthiest version of yourself. Mm. Right. Mm. Let's put it this way. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. If you don't take care of yourself, if you don't maximize your insulin sensitivity, if you don't control your blood glucose with precision, uh, the consequences can be very dire. So if you take the responsibility, which I do, and I take it to heart, it has transformed me into being the healthiest version of myself. I'm healthier today than I've ever been in my life. And I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I love it. I love it. Tell me anything that's going on with you, the mastering diabetes community that we should be aware of that we can participate in, um, for our listeners. Yeah, there's, there's two things I would say. Uh, number one is that, uh, we recently launched a challenge and the challenge is awesome because there's a lot of people who are like interested in getting involved in the mastering diabetes method, but they're nervous because, you know, they're not sure if they can eat bananas and mangoes and potatoes. And so we've constructed a challenge, which is a six week long challenge that teaches people exactly. We literally will hold your hand and show you exactly what to do over the course of six weeks. We'll give you a meal plan. We'll give you grocery lists. We'll give you exercises. We'll give you an accountability coach. And that way you can go through the entire process handheld without exception. And you'll get to a point within the first two to three to four weeks where you're going to be like, oh my Lord, this is definitely working, right? The challenge you can, you can participate in that by going to masteringdiabetes.org slash challenge. The second thing is that in November of every year, we have a blood sugar, uh, it's a blood sugar transformation summit. Mm. Okay. So the blood sugar transformation summit is really, really fun. And we, uh, we ask a lot of speakers to come in the world's experts on diabetes and we interview them and we provide this information for free. And it's a really fun opportunity for tens of thousands of people to join in and learn a lot about diabetes and what they can do to maximize their health. So look out for that. Just join our mailing list, go to masteringdiabetes.org, get on our mailing list and you'll hear about that. And uh, come November, it's going to be an explosion of really fun information. And uh, it's always a, a great event for everyone who, who participates. Yeah. Cyrus, you're a beautiful man. You're doing beautiful, incredible work. And I feel so fortunate and lucky that uh, our paths have crossed and we've become such great friends. So thank I, you for that. I fully agree. Thank you, Rip. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how much I enjoy hanging out with you in person and online. And uh, you are doing such a phenomenal service to the world of plant-based nutrition and to, to people who really need this information you know, through packaged products that they can easily buy at the grocery store, through education, through in-person events. I mean, you are a force for good and I hope one day to be as good as you. So I'm trying and hope. Well, you know, it. we're just trying to be BFFs, kind of like that cholesterol saturated fat, but the yeah. healthiest versions. That's right. I think we are BFFs, but haven't really <laughs> admitted it online until right now. <laughs> Woo. Hey, hit me up with a plant strong fist, my man. Boom, there it is. Boom. All right. Hey, man. I'll see you the next time you're in Austin. You got a deal. Thanks, my brother. To learn more about Cyrus and Robbie's Mastering Diabetes book and programs, visit www.masteringdiabetes.org. Of course, we'll link it all up in the show notes at plantstrongpodcast.com. And until next week, keep it real and always. 
keep it plan strong. The Plan Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.